uh, welcome uh, everybody to the seventh and the final conference organized during the Portuguese presidency of the European Union by the Embassy of Portugal in Prague with many uh, key, uh, very important uh, institutional uh, Czech uh, partners. This is a very important conference. I would even dare to say the most important of the cycle of seven conferences that uh, we had so far. Because today, to uh, really mark the final conference of our cycle, we will have with us the two uh, foreign ministers uh, of uh, the Czech Republic uh, and uh, Portugal. But before I introduce the ministers and before I set the scene for the debate between the two ministers, let me give the floor to Ms. Sharka Pratt. She represents the Institute for Politics and Society, a very prominent think tank in the Czech Republic, very well known in the think tank academic and political circles in the Czech Republic, and one of our main partners for today's conference. Sharka Pratt, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to address you in this welcome speech. As David Sassoli, the president of the European Parliament stated, this has been a year of lessons learned. And I believe this accurately reflects the EU's perspective. For more than a year now, the European Union has experienced an unprecedented crisis as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has caused major shocks throughout the European socio-economic environment. It not only halted the bloc's economic progress, but also deepened fragmentation between member states. Division within Europe is becoming increasingly concerning and citizens' confidence in the European model has wavered and national interests have become more apparent as a result of the pandemic. Portugal was presented with a difficult task heading the Council of the European Union. The Portuguese presidency facilitated a digital and green transition and the European pillar of social rights were established. These have proved to be essential for promoting convergence and social unity in the European Union. However, Europe's recovering is still ongoing and the EU has prepared its largest stimulus package yet. The multinational financial framework for 2021 to 2027 and the next generation EU have been launched which help boost recovery and prepare member states for uncertain times. Based on the concept of solidarity, the emergency support instrument assists the EU member states with mitigating the severe consequences of the virus. Despite the EU's immediate response to the pandemic, uncertainty still surrounds the alliance. For this reason, I cannot express enough how timely today's conference is. In order to coordinate the EU with citizens' needs, discussing Europe's future should be high on the agenda. And the dialogue between institutions and Europeans must deepen to explore the EU's potential. Following the pandemic, European solidarity should have a central role in strengthening intra-union cohesion. We must revitalize the European project and initiate a better dialogue on the future of Europe and find the common path forward together. And I believe we will definitely start that with this conference. Thank you very much. And I wish you a pleasant discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck uh, Pratt, for your remarks. I think that they were really useful in setting the tone for the uh, interventions that we are going to listen very carefully. Uh, let me uh, only say that this uh, seventh uh, conference uh, really uh, is uh, the end of a cycle when we try or through which we try to follow all the priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. And throughout our conferences, we have the presence of uh, members of the European Commission, 
we have the presence of uh, uh, members of the both governments, the Czech Republic one and the Portuguese one, as well as experts, academics, uh, very distinguished uh, personalities. We dealt with uh, the economic recovery and resilience. We dealt with the digital um, and climate energy transition. Uh, we spoke about the global uh, reach of the European Union. Uh, of course, we did not forget the implementation of the uh, social rights, the pillar of the social rights of the European Union. And we had even time to devote, to devote one conference to the comparison between the two revolutions, the Portuguese Democratic Revolution of 74 and the Czech Velvet Revolution, and one conference to speak about the strategic importance of the Portuguese language and culture. But today, we are going to talk, to talk about uh, uh, European Union integration, uh, to talk about foreign policy, to talk about the role that Southern and Central Europe uh, can play after the crisis. And uh, as uh, the title of our conference goes, uh, are they really indispensable partners of the European future? And to answer that question, I will uh, now give the floor to Minister Jakub Kulhanek, the the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. The Minister, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Ambassador. And uh, you. Uh, well, good, good, good afternoon to uh, um, uh, um, all of you uh, who have tuned in. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, unfortunately a, a sad reality of the uh, uh, COVID world. Uh, we are uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, confined uh, uh, um, to uh, the virtual uh, uh, world, uh, uh, however uh, much we all uh, wish uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, will uh, be soon over. However, for the time being, uh, well, uh, uh, this is the best we can do, but uh, um, um, I, I still believe uh, we are going to have an excellent uh, 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 discussion. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, 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 to uh, address you uh, this way, albeit virtually, uh, um, and uh, so we can discuss uh, um, the common opportunities and challenges uh, for our uh, two nations uh, in the, the, the post-COVID uh, era. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I wish I uh, uh, could meet my uh, uh, dear uh, 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 colleague, uh, 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 Minister uh, 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 Silva, uh, um, uh, personally. Although I have to say, uh, um, uh, I was lucky enough um, uh, uh, to uh, attend the informal uh, 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 meeting of EU uh, uh, foreign uh, ministers in, in Lisbon. Uh, the other day, uh, um, uh, really, I enjoyed it uh, a great deal, uh, and and only it was uh, it was a testament uh, uh, to uh, the Portuguese uh, EU presidency how well organised uh, and, and structured uh, the, the the whole uh, discussion uh, uh, was. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, let me use this opportunity uh, also uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, send my, my, my best regards uh, to, to, to Lisbon and, and extend my most sincere invitation uh, 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 to Minister to, to visit uh, 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 Prague uh, once uh, the situation uh, allows it. Uh, it's, it's interesting, and, and you know, we, we shouldn't forget about this, uh, 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 you know, this year uh, uh, we are uh, is celebrating uh, the 100th uh, uh, anniversary of uh, uh, our uh, bilateral uh, 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 relations. So, uh, again, however much I'd like to do uh, this in person, and I, uh, I, I feel we might uh, still have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to celebrate this uh, together should you come uh, to Prague. Um, you know, uh, uh, I always, uh, uh, we checks, uh, we don't say thank you, uh, uh, enough. Uh, so, so please, 
Uh, again, uh, uh, I'd like to thank the, 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 the Portuguese EU uh, uh, presidency for uh, doing um, um, uh, um, a, a great job uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, helping uh, navigate uh, the EU uh, uh, through uh, uh, difficult, uh, 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 difficult times uh, um, under, under um, uh, uh, your uh, uh, six months uh, uh, presidency. This was by no means uh, an easy task, but I think you, 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 you've performed, uh, 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 I, I think, with outstanding presidency and uh, uh, um, uh, um, again, uh, um, uh, given how difficult this was, you uh, deserve every credit. Uh, I, in my, it, 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 as for my introductory remarks, I, I want to touch on uh, um, our uh, uh, bilateral uh, relations uh, first, and then uh, uh, talk about some of the, the common challenges and uh, uh, then we should uh, 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 spend, uh, uh, hopefully spend more time uh, uh, answering uh, uh, questions. Well, uh, on, on our bilateral relations, uh, let me go back four years to recall uh, uh, Minister uh, uh, Silva's uh, visit to Prague in August uh, 2017. In his speech, addressing the annual assembly of uh, uh, Czech ambassadors, the minister identified lasting challenges to our common European future, such as Brexit, maintaining economic prosperity, and the need for EU's more active international role. Well, uh, as, as we're standing at the dawn of the post-COVID uh, era, the Czech Republic still views these uh, challenges as quite uh, pressing. The United Kingdom's exit uh, has left uh, a considerable void, and uh, it only makes uh, cooperation among like-minded countries uh, more urgent and, and more, 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 more important. The Czech Republic cherishes its stable and positive relationship with Portugal especially in the, in the area of deepening economic development and our uh, common support for the deepening of the single market. It is crucial to have such a reliable partner in times of severe economic difficulties. There is a lot of potential for cooperation, not only in the economic area, but also in this uh, in, 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 in when, when it comes to education and culture. Let me give you two examples though. Over the last 10 years, more than 2,000 Portuguese students have graduated in medical sciences from, from, from Czech universities. This is quite impressive. In 2016, the Czech Republic was, was the first EU country to gain observer uh, status in the community of Portuguese language uh, countries. So again, there's plenty to build on. Um, now, uh, let me briefly turn uh, to uh, uh, the Portuguese EU presidents. Uh, I'd like to praise uh, uh, um, uh, your uh, leadership uh, uh, during its, its, its presidency of the Council of the European Union during this semester. The five main priorities of the Portuguese pre uh, presidency, resilient Europe, social Europe, green Europe, digital Europe, and glo global Europe, strongly resonated not only with us uh, uh, here in Prague, but also with other uh, uh, partners in Brussels. As you may well know, uh, the Czech Republic is currently gearing up for its presidency in the second half of uh, uh, 2022. And we are eager listeners for any adv advice you may want to pass down to us. Well, the Czech Republic has been drafting the 18 months trio uh, program with our uh, partners, uh, France and Sweden. On the national level, in the field of external uh, relations alone, we have identified several horizontal and geographical priorities. Well, as to, uh, as, as to these priorities, we want a strong Europe, meaning we would like to be a reliable transatlantic ally. 
a responsible neighbor and a credible partner for effective multilateral solutions. We also want a resilient Europe that will successfully tackle um, all the new challenges while countering hybrid threats. And we clearly need a sustainable Europe concentrating, concentrating on climate change, competitiveness, and solidarity. As for our geographic uh, priorities, well, the, uh, the, those include the Western Balkans, the European neighborhood uh, in the East and South, and last but not least, the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Well, and uh, let me, uh, let me uh, conclude uh, by um, discussing the uh, post-pandemic uh, uh, world and the, the challenges ahead. Um, well, we, while we are eagerly awaiting uh, the, age, uh, the, the end of this pandemic and uh, looking forward to uh, what uh, uh, might uh, come next, uh, I mean, we have to be uh, quite realistic and recognize uh, that uh, uh, this post-pandemic era won't be uh, easy. There are two main topics uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, mention. Well, first, economic recovery and conference on the future of Europe. Regarding the economic recovery, the Czech government recently approved the national recovery plan, which we hope will be a great boost to um, the uh, uh, well-being of uh, the Czech Republic. We appreciate last year's historical shift in the EU's stance on financial support, thanks to which we aim for a, a swift and speedy economic recovery. As for the Conference for the Future of Europe, the Czech Republic very much welcomes the, 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 the launch of the Conference for the Future of Europe, which took place on the 9th of May, and we are ready to play an active part in this process, especially given our role in the executive board. We would like to emphasize that citizens, rather than institutions, must be at the center of the whole process, and we therefore welcome their increased representation in the plenary. The conference will only be successful if the EU is able to address the issues that are of real importance to its citizens. The Czech Republic is not in favor of potential uh, uh, changes to the treaties. Instead, we should rather uh, aim to fully utilize the potential provided by the current legal framework. Um, and, and also, we very much support involving in a you know, suitable way the citizens of the Western Balkans countries in discussions on the future of Europe, because we consider them part of our common European future. Well, let me conclude by recalling uh, Minister Silva's words from his Prague visit in 2017, which still uh, uh, resonates quite a lot. The European Union is a process. It is underpinned by shared values, inclusive approach to diversity, and rational discussion. Well, we had such kind of discussion during the cycle of conferences organized by the Portuguese EU presidency here in Prague. We also frequently hold, have hold, we, we hold such discussions in Brussels with other partners. And this approach alone enables us to face difficult uh, uh, challenges such as the COVID pandemic or the EU's uh, international uh, role together and in full force. Let us treasure our partnerships and work to, uh, towards common goal of a resilient Europe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Minister, for for your uh, very comprehensive uh, initial remarks. Um, uh, let me uh, say that uh, when it comes to our bilateral relations, you mentioned the economic front. Of course, I will leave that to you, to both ministers, also to dwell on that. But let me only recall that. Uh, 
Uh, even today, uh, this morning, uh, we launched the Economic Forum uh, with the presence of more than 100 Portuguese and Czech companies as our uh, contribution exactly to fostering the deepening of our economic uh, and trade bilateral relation, relationship. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, overall uh, remarks. Um, and uh, uh, the main thrust uh, of the idea that uh, the future that is there in front of us is a, is a future of uh, uh, deeper uh, European Union integration. And with, with that in mind, uh, looking at the post-pandemic uh, uh, future uh, and asking the question how Portugal and how the Czech Republic together could contribute to deepen uh, the European project. Uh, Minister Augusto Santos Silva, uh, please, thank you very much for being with us. And now uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear Ambassador, dear Minister, dear um, Jakub. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And I also thank um, uh, Sharka Pratt, the Executive Director of the Institute for Politics and Society, for uh, co-organizing uh, this uh, conference, this seminar. Um, in my uh, introductory remarks, I will uh, focus on uh, three uh, points very briefly. Um, the, the first one uh, um, is uh, on uh, the, the similarities of um, um, the Portugal and the Czech Republic in what regards the democratic transition and the European accession of both uh, countries. You know, of course, that uh, in international relations, we always say that uh, geography counts a lot, history counts a lot, institutional traditions count a lot, but uh, the history of the European construction is also the proof that uh, uh, most of all, what counts is the options that uh, democratically and freely people do in order to determine their future. And uh, the Portuguese recent history and uh, the Czech uh, recent history show very clearly that first it was a crucial option of uh, the two uh, peoples to abide by uh, the rules, the values, the principles of uh, European democracy, meaning pluralistic, multi-party, uh, liberal democracies. Uh, that was uh, um, the way through which uh, Portugal uh, uh, overcame a dictatorship that was the longest dictatorship of Europe in the 20th century and our Carnation Revolution in 1974. And uh, 15 years later, uh, the Czechs uh, decided to um, overcome uh, their uh, previous uh, a subordination to the Soviet Empire and to adhere to uh, the principles and the institutions of a pluralistic liberal democracy. And in both cases, the democratization, the, tra the democratic transition was very, very linked with the, the prospects of uh, European integration. It was clear for our uh, uh, founding uh, father of the democracy, Mario Soares, that uh, these were the two faces of the same uh, coin, uh, the democratic transition uh, and European integration. Because uh, Mario Soares always uh, uh, to told us that um, the European integration was the best way to consolidate the democracy in, uh, in Portugal. So uh, one of the first decisions of the first constitutional democratic government in Portugal in 1976-1977 was to ask for the accession of uh, Portugal to the European communities, to the then European communities. It was a 10-year long process, but finally in 1986 we um, uh, integrated the, the European communities and since then the liberal, civil, pluralistic democracy in Portugal is really uh, profoundly connected with uh, this sense of our belonging to uh, Europe. 
Um, and the same goes uh, in uh, the Czech case, uh, because uh, uh, this was uh, also um, one of the main uh, thoughts and uh, discourses of uh, your uh, founding uh, father of uh, democracy, Václav Havel, and uh, he also put clearly that uh, democratic transition and European integration were linked process. So this is my first point, my first lesson that I think we can draw from uh, the Portuguese and the, the Czech uh, experiences. Yes, history has a, is, its specific wave uh, and influence. Geography is a very important determinant uh, of uh, international relations and geopolitics, but the main variable, the key variable is our will, our political will, the options that uh, we do as uh, societies. And um, this is why, um, at least uh, from a Portuguese perspective, we believe, of course, in uh, the regional differences and uh, the regional diversity of Europe, but we refuse to be uh, in a certain way uh, anchored to one single regional belonging or one single regional uh, alliance. Uh, we, of course, uh, belong to the Southern uh, Europe. We are uh, members of what we call the MET7, the informal gathering of uh, prime ministers and uh, ministers of uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Malta, um, Greece, uh, France and uh, Cyprus. Um, but we say that uh, at the same time we belong to the European Atlantic Arch. So we have close relations with uh, Denmark, with uh, Ireland, uh, with uh, the Netherlands. We used to have uh, close relations within the European Union with uh, the United Kingdom, of course. And we um, uh, ensure in each circumstance uh, good relations uh, bridge um, always um, uh, permanent uh, with uh, the central and northern uh, European member states. Um, so that's why we uh, always say that, uh, of course, regional diversity is very important. Regional uh, political diversity is, um, uh, of course, important. But Europe is a mosaic and no one is uh, in a certain way closed in uh, some uh, uh, particular region, some particular area, or some political, ideological, or uh, uh, political orientation. So, first uh, lesson, I think, uh, we can have positive conclusions of the two experiences, Czech and Portuguese, in this uh, connection so uh, profound between uh, the democratic transition and European integration. Uh, my second uh, point is um, on uh, um, the needs that we have as middle-sized countries of the logic of uh, uh, the European integration, of the idea that uh, we do better when we do it at European level. Uh, these um, have a um, uh, close link with uh, the Portuguese presidency's priorities. Um, we, um, we define the, the program of our presidency of the Council of the European Union, taking into consideration what were the strategic decisions that our leaders made in uh, the second semester of 2020 two uh, strategic decisions. The first one was to respond to the dimension of the crisis caused by the pandemic with um, a response, uh, a financial, um, uh, financial funds um, that uh, could lever our recovery, so uh, financial uh, funds of uh, equivalent uh, dimension. This was the decision to launch at the same time uh, of um, the next uh, uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework, a specific program, uh, Next Generation EU, deliberately 
uh, design for uh, responding to the current uh, economic and social and sanitary crisis. First strategic decision of our leaders in uh, last July. And the second strategic uh, decision was the decision to uh, use the European procurement to um, purchase the vaccines necessary to a massive universal vaccination of our populations. Um, these uh, two strategic decisions were already taken uh, when uh, the Portuguese presidency started last January. So our program could be defined in a single word, a single verb to deliver. Decisions were taken. Uh, our responsibility was to implement these decisions. Time to deliver. This was and this is the motto of the Portuguese presidency. And I'm referring to this fact because um, uh, this option of the Portuguese presidency, this uh, program, this kind of priorities um, show how important is the European uh, collective action, how important is the Euro Europe wide scale for uh, the uh, decision making uh, process to lever our own uh, economies, our own uh, recovers to build better and uh, build back better our uh, societies. Um, when uh, we uh, decided to uh, put in place the Recovery and Resilience uh, Fund, when we decided to launch the, um, the EU uh, Next Generation Programme, when uh, we decided to use in uh, these uh, forthcoming years the most uh, uh, the, the, the the most important the largest uh, financial uh, program that uh, ever existed in Europe, we had a purpose, and the purpose was to preserve our internal market to preserve one of the main outcomes of the European integration. And when we decided that uh, the vaccination strategy would be a uh, European uh, vaccination strategy, would be a common uh, uh, European uh, strategy, um, what we intended was to accelerate the process of vaccination and to obtain as soon as possible, our goals of uh, immunizing our uh, populations. So um, this shows very clearly how important is, is Europe and how important is Europe, is Europe specifically for uh, small and medium sized countries. And we all know that, um, for instance, Malta is a small country uh, uh, by according to European criteria, the Czech Republic, uh, Portugal or Austria or Belgium are medium sized countries uh, by uh, the European criteria. Of course, in Europe, Germany or um, uh, France or Italy are um, uh, large countries, but we also know that at the world scale, we are all from Germany to Malta, small or medium-sized countries. So we all need Europe. Uh, Germany needs Europe, France needs Europe, the Czech Republic needs Europe, Portugal needs Europe, and the vaccination process and the uh, recovery and resilience um, uh, funds are clear demonstrations of this need. If we were acting alone, we would have much worse results. And the process of vaccination, the process of uh, the, the sanitary response to the pandemic and the process of uh, the economic and social reco recovery would uh, be less ambitious and uh, would be uh, less uh, fruitful. So that's my second lesson. We all need Europe. But, of course, 
medium-sized countries like uh, the Republic, uh, the Czech Republic or Portugal need Europe in a very profound sense. Third and last point, uh, symmetrically, reversely, Europe needs countries like the Czech Republic or Portugal. Needs countries that are medium-sized countries that uh, understand uh, the problems and uh, the opportunities, the challenges, but also the resources that um, uh, these kind of countries um, belonging to different geographies and uh, belonging to different uh, histories um, uh, propose and uh, uh, present. But Europe uh, needs um, the diversity that we provide. Uh, Europe needs the additional links that we provide to Europe. Uh, Portugal by uh, the, the easy way in which we dialogue uh, with uh, Africa or Latin America, the Czech Republic because uh, of the way the Czechs understand and act in uh, the Eastern neighborhood, the Balkans or in, in the Middle Europe, in the Central Europe. So uh, uh, Europe, uh, Brussels, uh, this uh, metaphor of Europe needs the contribution of uh, uh, the various states, including the medium-sized uh, states with different uh, traditions and with different uh, histories. And uh, Europe needs um, as well uh, our diversity. The European Union is not a state, nor a federation, nor a confederation, nor, by the way, an international organization is a sui generis uh, association of independent uh, uh, states and also a very a mosaic of different uh, civilizations, of different nations, of these uh, different cultural traditions. And this is uh, what enriches the most European Union. So I would say that um, the Czech Republic and uh, Portugal can show how important is this link, uh, crucial link between uh, Europe and democracy, lesson number one. We can uh, uh, demonstrate how important is the European level of uh, decision and association to use in the best way possible uh, our resources and uh, put in place uh, our uh, programs and political options, lesson number two. But lesson number three, we are also uh, indispensable for Europe because uh, Europe needs our diversity, Europe needs our contribution, and Europe needs our capacity to being Europeans, to see beyond Europe uh, towards uh, the world and uh, other regions than uh, Europe. I would say that uh, these uh, three introductory remarks uh, could help uh, our debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, we do it better when we do it at the European level. Uh, what you said uh, uh, is, is very important, uh, uh, encapsulates the importance of uh, bridging differences and creating uh, synergies. Uh, let me uh, ask you to, to, to reflect on uh, uh, what uh, it means to try to create those synergies and to bridge differences and prompt uh, uh, real joint ventures when it comes to a more uh, practical, but uh, even though practical, but very much related to the deepening of the European project. Uh, Portugal, as Minister uh, Santos Silva very well said, uh, relates very easily with uh, Latin America, uh, Brazil, with Africa, with the uh, Atlantic uh, and uh, beyond Atlantic space that defines our uh, history, our tradition. Uh, but also the way our business is so uh, very well related to. We know uh, much less than the Czechs do 
of uh, the so-called Eastern Partnership, the countries of Central Europe, the countries of the V4, that is a, a group where the Czech Republic is, is very active and very prominent, uh, how to do in terms of fostering the European project, how to bridge those uh, potentialities in the sense that uh, we need to take into account that Portugal is member of the common currency, member of the euro, uh, belongs to the European Union uh, a little bit longer than the Czech Republic. Uh, we are uh, in the driving seat uh, in what regards the deepening of the economic and monetary union. The Czech Republic uh, is no member of the European uh, currency so far. That debate is on hold uh, here in the Czech Republic. Uh, at the same time, uh, not only because of not belonging to the euro, but also as a singular consequence of the safety nets created uh, by the fact that they are not yet part of the common currency facing the last uh, financial crisis, for instance. The Czech Republic relies heavily on exports. More than 90% of their GDP uh, is export related. The public debt is uh, very low and uh, the unemployment is also remarkably low. So how can you compare uh, in the sense of uh, promoting uh, beyond uh, cohesion, beyond the fact that both countries are members of the group of friends of cohesion, uh, being exactly, as Minister Santos Silva put it, uh, the reflection, the demonstration that Europe needs countries like Portugal and the Czech Republic. That would be my challenge to, to you both. Uh, Minister Kohanek, please. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, uh, well, you, you, you certainly know how, how, how to ask um, a, a, a tricky question. Uh, 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 Look, uh, uh, I, 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 I very much liked uh, 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 what uh, my uh, uh, Portuguese uh, uh, colleague had to say. Uh, well, uh, I mean, our uh, cooperation, uh, uh, basically, I mean, to, to dumb it down uh, um, a little bit, uh, you know, it's primarily about delivering. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, we simply have to deliver to, 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 to our citizens. I mean, uh, uh, quite fr frankly, it's, 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 it is that simple. Uh, uh, look, uh, so in, in, in order uh, uh, for us to, um, uh, you know, foster uh, 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 European cooperation, uh, I mean, we, we really have to focus on, on those, uh, you know, uh, pr uh, practical examples of, 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 of cooperation and really focus on those because, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how we can deliver real uh, a change, a positive change. And, and, and this, is, uh, this, is, this is important. So through practical cooperation, I mean, this is how to uh, uh, drive this whole, whole process. I mean, let, let's be completely honest here. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the EU, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for better or worse, uh, you know, at times gets, you know, uh, uh, criticised for, you know, being too com complex or too, too, too distant. I mean, be that as it may, uh, uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, um, it, it really comes uh, down to, uh, you know, how to demonstrate that this uh, uh, noble project, uh, but, but you know, highly complex, and, and that's that's what happens when you end up, you know, with twenty-seven member states. But how this whole process, uh, uh, how we can can move it forward, and I I, I I think that you know we should you know redouble our effort, you know, to to uh, to showcase uh, you know the the, the all, all the positive. Uh, that the EU is doing uh, um, uh, 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 when it comes to uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, its, its citizens. And I mean, there's, there is a lot, you know. So sometimes, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we ought to uh, take a step back and, 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 and focus on those, you know, perhaps little things, but those 
those those things actually matter a great deal to uh, to to ordinary uh, uh, people who might sort of uh, uh, feel uh, uh, you know maybe anxious about uh, the the overall direction of the, the, the European integration. But I think uh, you know it is important uh, uh, for us. Uh, to to highlight uh, uh, those uh, things, uh, uh, um, uh, and that's 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 perhaps uh, uh, and to answer your question, that's that's how we can foster more uh, uh, cooperation uh, in the in the EU. Mm -hmm. Minister Santos Silva, would you like to comment, please? Yes, thank you. Just uh, to add some uh, elements to the response of my colleague and uh, friend, the Czech minister. Uh, first uh, element. Um, um, in order to cooperate better, one very easy way is to recognize the areas in which we are uh, already very aligned. I would give uh, two examples out of a certain number of uh, examples I could uh, identify in what regards the alignment uh, between the Czech Republic and Portugal in terms of uh, external policy. The first example is uh, the trade negotiations and the trade agreements. Uh, we have um, the two countries have a very open uh, perspective. We are not, we are not uh, protectionists and we do think that uh, trade agreements are a, a very important uh, instrument not only to foster economic global uh, growth, but also to obtain gains in terms of uh, geopolitics and uh, international relations. So we are uh, both defenders of the ratification of the Mercosur agreement and of the conclusion of the negotiations for the modernization of the agreements with Mexico and Chile, for example. The second example is the African uh, perspective of the two countries. We both think, uh, Czech Republic and Portugal, that uh, in a certain sense, uh, Africa is not only the past of Europe, is the future of Europe, the complementarity of the two continents is uh, obvious. And uh, um, that is one of the reasons uh, by which the Czech Republic was one of the first European countries to ask for the um, uh, position uh, of uh, observer to the community of Portuguese speaking countries and uh, it's um, it's um, reinforcing enhancing um, its um, uh, political auction action vis-a-vis -vis Africa uh, like Portugal we have the same attitude towards uh, Africa so first element um, the best way <laughs> a sociologist can say this, the best way is to, to improve cooperation is to recognize the areas in which this cooperation already exists and the objective conditions for this enhancement already exist. Second element, one of the most important ways of uh, improving bilateral relations is to learn um, to uh, to to learn from the other, uh, from the other's uh, experience. Um, I just uh, want to reiterate something uh, that you, Ambassador, already uh, pointed out: uh, the fact that the Czech Republic constitutes a, a role model for Portugal in what regards the internationalization of our economy. Uh, whenever mm -hmm. we define. Uh, targets for the improvement of the weight of uh, our exports in our GDP, we say we can uh, do more. Uh, by now, it's 40% uh, of our GDP, the value of the exports, and we always say, well, the Czechs are uh, well ahead of us and we can learn with their experience. Second uh, element. And uh, the third element is um, to uh, to transform the diversity and uh, sometimes the different uh, differences of uh, perspective or interest into an asset, into uh, a, a driving force. Um, the, 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 
the geographical um, insertion of Portugal and uh, the Czech Republic uh, is very different, of course. And this is, <laughs> I say it again, um, um, a signal uh, of um, uh, in richness. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a rich uh, element we can uh, benefit from. Uh, so uh, I think this. Uh, bilateral cooperation within uh, Europe that characterizes the relation between Czech Republic and uh, uh, Portugal is at the same time an increasing and improving cooperation outside uh, Europe, namely in what regards the external policy of Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis its immediate neighborhood, but also vis-a-vis -vis Africa and Latin America. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Thank you, Ministers. Uh, I, I am uh, very well aware that uh, you have limited time and we are uh, approaching the moment of uh, uh, the final remarks for this uh, uh, opening session of our uh, last conference. That Let me only uh, say that uh, uh, we have the project uh, of uh, uh, publishing uh, a book with the main the contents, the main takeaways of the entire cycle of conferences. Of course, your interventions will uh, be prominent in that publication. I am grateful to the European Commission representation in Prague uh, for the funding uh, provided for that publication. And the idea is that uh, that book uh, will, uh, will be painted during the Czech presidency of the European Union so uh, in the uh, second half of 2022 as the portuguese contribution to that uh, uh, specific uh, moment that we will follow especially here from prague with great uh, attention but of course uh, you ministers will be uh, able to, to review the text because before it is uh, printed out but your interventions today will i repeat uh, figure prominently uh, in that book. I, I have to thank you both for your presence. But let me only say as a concluding remark that uh, uh, it is uh, very rewarding uh, not to uh, have the opportunity to moderate this conversation, uh, to uh, be uh, aware that uh, you both are engaged in deepening our bilateral relations that uh, most probably during the near future, uh, as soon as the circumstances allow Minister Sam Silva will visit the Czech Republic and Minister Jakub Kulanek will also have the opportunity to, 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 to visit, uh, to visit uh, Portugal. Uh, of the many challenges that we had not opportunity to discuss today with the limited uh, time frame of our debate is of course the question of the global impact of the new US administration that will have an impact on multilateralism and also on the trade, the international trade and global dimension that Minister Sam Silva alluded to. But I am sure that the remaining panels of our conference will also leave us an opportunity to highlight and to refer to these very important topical matters of the international context. We are going to have a panel with the deputy ministers and state secretaries, both incumbent and former of both our countries, and we'll have, we'll have a panel with very prestigious uh, academics and uh, think tankers. Uh, but I would like uh, still, uh, with the presence of the ministers, uh, to call their attention for the following. The last panel of this conference will have, from both sides, Portuguese and Czech side, three generations of uh, uh, interlocutors of the European uh, project. Uh, a Portuguese and a Czech that uh, participated at the very inception of our mutual integrations in the European institutions, then a more middle-aged, so to say, kind of personalities, and finishing with very young, very bright, sometimes very reverent participants of the European uh, debate. So it will be a full-fledged conference that I hope that those who can will follow because it is not only about the ministers but until now it was the ministers with this vip 
uh, segment of our conference, and I am deeply grateful to both Minister Jakub Kuhanek and to Minister Augusto Sam Silva for finding the time to share and to be uh, generously amongst uh, us this afternoon. Thank you, Ministers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And see yes. you in Luxembourg, Jakub. <laughs> yes, yeah, in, indeed. And, and again, you know, thank you. And, and, and what, what a terrific job you, you, you've done. I mean, your, your presidency is something we'll be looking up to, uh, uh, you know, when gearing up for, for our presidency. So, so thank, thank you. you. Thank job you. well done. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Now, while uh, taking uh, leave of uh, both uh, Ministers of Foreign Affairs, let me move uh, without any technical break uh, to the uh, first uh, panel of our uh, conference. I will in a moment uh, hand uh, uh, the floor uh, to Dana Kovarikova. Dana Kovarikova uh, is the head of the European Commission representation in Prague. Uh, she will moderate uh, 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 much better than I could uh, uh, do the first panel. Uh, let me only uh, make a technical remark. Uh, Minister uh, Kohut uh, will be uh, with us, but a little bit later in the panel. Uh, so I would recommend, uh, Dana, that you start with the Portuguese Director General for uh, European Affairs, uh, and then uh, uh, you will uh, give the floor to the other Portuguese and Czech uh, participants, uh, finishing with uh, Deputy Minister Howard, that in the meantime will for sure uh, join us. Uh, I am, of course, at your entire disposal uh, if I am needed, which I will be not. But let me uh, say that uh, this panel uh, uh, has guests that will allow the debate about. Uh, uh, our uh, mutual processes of integration uh, to go a little bit uh, deeper, not only in, in technical terms, but also uh, in what uh, it meant uh, the exercise of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union, uh, what are the achievements, what were the obstacles, uh, what remains to be done, uh, and what are the expectations uh, for the Czech presidency of the European Union that will follow, as we know, the Slovenian one and the French already part of the next trio. Dana Kovarikova, uh, again, thanking you very much for your support, uh, the support not only for this conference, but throughout for the entire cycle of our conferences. And now uh, you are at the helm uh, and uh, you are the uh, master of the game. Uh, Dana, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words, you, Luis. And uh, good afternoon from my side. Good afternoon from the European House. And welcome uh, to the first panel uh, of this conference, where we are going to to further discuss, actually, respective roles of Portugal and the Czech Republic in the European architecture and context. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Dana Kovaříková. I'm the head of the European Commission representation in the Czech Republic, and I'm going to guide you through the next hour. So as uh, as we said, we have with us uh, very distinguished speakers. I'm very pleased that uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Rui Vinyash, Director General for European Affairs of Portugal. Mr. Vinyash, welcome. Hello. Uh, we should also have with us uh, Mr. Stepan Czerny, uh, Director of uh, in charge of coordination of European policies in the Office of the Government of the Czech Republic. Uh, Mr. Czerny, are you with us? Hello. Hello. Uh, and we have also Mr. Bruno Messange, former Secretary of State uh, for European Affairs of Portugal and currently non-resident fellow at a senior fellow, sorry, at Hudson Institute and a senior advisor at Flint Global in London. Uh, Mr. Messange, welcome also. And uh, as uh, Ambassador uh, Luis said, uh, Mr. Uh, Jan Koho, Deputy Minister for European Affairs of the Czech Republic, uh, should be with us within short. So uh, welcome and everybody, and thank you very much for being with us. Um, 
in previous contributions we have heard a lot uh, how much Portugal and the Czech Republic have in common, not only in terms of size, but uh, very importantly in the overall European context. Uh, there are many timely topics on which we can follow up within the next hour. Uh, both countries' respective presidencies, their priorities, debate in the context of conference on, uh, on the future of Europe, economic recovery of Europe and many others. So with this, uh, let me give the floor to our first speaker, uh, which is Mr. Rui Vinyash, Director General for European Affairs in Portugal, and ask him for his opening remarks. Mr. Vinyash, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation, particularly to Luis Olen de Sampaio, our, our ambassador in Prague. Uh, uh, and um, hello also to all the colleagues in the panel. Special compliment to Bruno Massange, a uh, uh, good friend and my former boss, uh, actually, as well. So. <laughs> Um, uh, I, uh, I think my task is relatively easy. I think my, my minister has done the most difficult part. But I was asked to talk a bit about the Portuguese presidency uh, of um, the 2021, first semester of 2021. I, um, I, will, I will maybe um, structure the, uh, my short intervention in three parts, beginning uh, for uh, uh, where we were in the second half of 2020. I mean, uh, um, the political context. I mean, many times uh, I've, I've, I've been hearing the comparisons between this is our fourth presidency, and uh, many times I've been hearing comparisons between this presidency and others. And I'm, uh, I think that we should not do that at all, because it's uh, the analysis greed. I mean, even the, uh, the metrics is completely different. Uh, for the first time, uh, uh, and I hope for the last, uh, we have the presidency uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, this simple fact changes everything. And this is, um, uh, this was also for the first time in history, we have responded to a, to a, a pandemic in an entirely humanistic uh, approach. Uh, um, human life and the health first. Uh, this is a big, uh, civilizational step, but of course, the social and economic costs of uh, of this uh, of the crisis that we have uh, uh, is, is 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 huge, and unfortunately, it occurs uh, not many years after the previous economic and financial crisis. Uh, the pandemic also imposes big limitations. I mean, the simple fact that physical meetings are. Uh, a very rare commodity. Uh, uh, it reduces and affects the, the speed of, of, with which we conduct uh, dossiers and negotiations. Then um, um, com um, we also um, have to take into account that the crisis, uh, the, the, the big economic and financial crisis of 2008 2014, uh, um, uh, its effects are still around. So uh, the European project is different. Uh, the EU is quite different today than it was, for instance, in our last presidency in 2007, even in the way it operates. Uh, a third element uh, that we took into account as well in our political assessment back in 2020 um, uh, was also the Treaty of Lisbon. I mean, uh, as some of you might know, the, the, the signature brand or the watermark of our previous presidents were the uh, external relations. I mean, uh, summits with Africa, summits uh, with uh, Brazil. That was clearly uh, uh, what, uh, in a way, Portugal brought to, 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 to the presidencies. With the Treaty of Lisbon, that is not uh, possible, although it's much more difficult uh, anymore, because, I mean, the, the, the foreign policy has now uh, a face, it's the high representative, and in terms of summits, is the president of the European Council. So uh, we have we we have to change also our our uh, mind frame in terms of approaching presidencies. Um, then we we also uh, approached our presidency with the unprecedented uh, situation of having one less member state uh, seated at the table, given the departure of the UK. I mean. Uh, this, I mean, it's 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 a huge political uh, uh, has a huge political significance because six enlargements after 
This was the, the first time that since, the, since 1957 that the centrifugal uh, forces uh, won uh, as a victory vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the centripetal forces in the European construction, uh, construction process. So this is also a, um, a, a very important political element uh, that we uh, uh, that we took in. Then it was also uh, our presidency after the what we call uh, the Great Divider, or some analysts call the 9/11 of Europe. That was the migration crisis in the, back in 2015, 14-15. Uh, uh, so. This is still a problem. Uh, we are actually today in Luxembourg, the ministers of, Int of interior are, are meeting uh, uh, and uh, have this problem in the, in, in the table. Uh, we are not uh, yet there. Uh, and it is a problem that will affect Europe for many years. I, 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 um, um, then also the political atmospherics in Europe has also changed. I mean, uh, nationalistic, populistic, uh, protectionist trends uh, also, the the uh, huge turbulence in the, in our neighborhood, uh, even the, the the international context with uh, with um, uh, geopolitical balances and the pressure, the multilateral uh, system uh, being openly contested. So this is just to give you um, the flavor. Uh, um, uh, so. Uh, and, uh, but of course, the pandemic was uh, was a key element. Uh, so we, uh, I mean, we looked into uh, the new strategic strategic agenda that the leaders of the of the leaders of, uh, of European uh, countries has, has adopted uh, some months before, and also to the program of the new Commission, very a very fresh new Commission. And we try to, and we have defined a program or designed a program that has two, three uh, overarching priorities: the, the economic uh, recovery, of course, uh, it's a, it's a basic one, with some declinations on the digital and green transitions, the the social dimension, uh, this uh, enhancing the social European dimension, and the. Uh, the open the, the strategic autonomy but with an open an Europe open to the to the world I mean this prefix open uh, it's 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 something I would like to stress because it, it is important for us we don't we don't see Europe as a fortress and as I, I mentioned before uh, by, by the contrary I mean in previous presidents we we have always tried to open Europe to to other regions in the world so I mean, um, uh, first and foremost, and maybe this is uh, and, and, and uh, going uh, going now uh, to the to what I can uh, say on each of these uh, of these um, uh, priorities and uh, some of the deliverables of the Portuguese presidency. I think that uh, probably uh, for some of the professionals around the, around the, around the, in this webinar. Maybe uh, uh, restoring the normalcy of the work of the council, restoring the pace of the council works, was probably one of the, the greatest achievements of our presidency. Because it's, it seems nothing, but under the a pandemic circumstances, it's uh, it's quite something, and, and it's the, a precondition for everything. Uh, uh, we have to take into account that the two previous presidencies were not able to restore uh, the normal work of the council. And without that, you cannot uh, move ahead with the important files. And this is a presidency, very much a legislative presidency. We, uh, the new commission has launched the big files on the digital and, and green transition. So, uh, and also the, the MFF uh, legislative processes, and we have to, to to incorporate that in our program and to try to to, to close it uh, as far as we as we could. Um, then COVID nineteen, because COVID nineteen was of course at the forefront of our agenda during the semester. More uh, intense coordination uh, every day in different uh, layers of the European Union vaccination campaign, increasing vaccination production, redistribution of vaccines. And finally, and probably uh, what I would like to stress as uh, our main uh, achievement in the presidency, uh, and particularly in the record uh, time, 
the COVID certificate that I think it's it's a tool that allows us to have uh, uh, more clarity, more, more and more safe uh, uh, summer season, and also to restore some freedom of circulation in, in Europe. Um, uh, on the economic recovery, uh, on that, that was our uh, clearly a, a top priority, and, um, and, uh, and for, for, for the Portuguese government was very clear that it, this was absolutely key. Um, if, uh, if I may use a metaphor, our economies during uh, many months in 2020 and 2021 were in a sort of uh, an ICU uh, and, uh, and the ventilator and the national budgets were the ventilators, uh, has been working as ventilators. So uh, we are on the verge of a major economic and social crisis and, and running out of time. So concluding all the stages of, uh, in the approval process of the financial package that uh, our uh, our leaders approved in uh, or agreed in, in in July 2020 was for us a, a top priority, uh, and we tr we have also tried to lead by example. We were the third member state in ratification of the decision of all resources, and we were the first to present uh, uh, the the plan on national uh, reform and resilience. Uh, so finally, on the 31st of May, we concluded in all the 27, the ratification of the, of the decision on, on, of own resources, and that uh, empowers the Commission to borrow the 750,000 million euros on behalf of the European Union and uh, tr start making available the funds under the Recovery and Resilience Facility. So this is a, a, a big step. Uh, we, we, we have tried even uh, faster, but this is uh, just to, to have an idea. I mean, uh, uh, the, the decision was, the final decision was uh, in December, uh, because uh, although the agreement was in July, the final decision was in December, and we concluded this process of the ratification by the 27th in May. So uh, last time in the previous uh, multi-annual financial framework, it took two years, uh, this process. So uh, it's, it's slower than the US, that in two months they had a pa financial package uh, adopted, but that's the difference between one state and 27. But it was missed uh, uh, than in previous, uh, in previous situations. So um, uh, we will continue to push uh, to see if it's possible to, to approve the first batch of uh, plans, still uh, national recovery plans, still under our presidency. And uh, we will see if, if, if possible uh, to have a, an ECOFIN extraordinary meeting in the end of June, if, uh, if, if needed to adopt uh, the first four or five uh, 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 plans. Uh, we'll also have a recovery summit to discuss the European economic recovery in the end of the month. So this is, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also to add that all the regulations on the MFF were concluded. I mean, so the, that, that job was also done, and I think we, we, we're quite happy with that. The social summit, uh, I mean, this, is, uh, this was something that we start to, to think about it before the pandemic. Uh, the idea was basically to to uh, to try to I mean to try to mitigate the effects of the the twin transition the digital and the, and the green transition and to uh, that will have a huge impact in the, in our societies in our economies in our labor markets and uh, the idea was a bit to to enhancing the social dimension uh, to try to to to. To, be, to have a more fair and inclusive uh, transition, uh, uh, the transition process. Um, so um, uh, we thought about it, and but uh, with the pandemic, it it it, it makes even more sense because uh, the, the crisis is is here, and uh, uh, and we have to to have also in the social dimension the response to uh, to to that crisis. Uh, um, if we turn into what was the summit of Oporto, clearly one of the, the high, high, highlights of our presidency, 
we we had a two, uh, the first compromise of uh, subscribed by all social partners. So if we compare to Gothenburg, the, 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 the summit uh, that the Swedish uh, organized four years ago, in which was established the, the, the European social pillar and the, the principles of the European social pillar, in, in Porto, we, we tried to add two elements. Uh, one element is to, to move from the, the principles to action and to endorse and approve the, the action plan that the Commission has presented uh, on, on, in March. So we did it. Uh, and the other element was to, to bring everybody around the, 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 the compromise and the, the, the action plan uh, meaning the, the business community and the, and, the, and, the, and the union, so all the social partners. So we have sub subscribed that uh, social compromise on, uh, on the first day of the summit and then we have a, a meeting, uh, a European, uh, uh, informal European Council on the second day and uh, we have uh, in a way uh, endorsed that, that result. And that I think it was a very, uh, a very, a very positive uh, dimension and we have fulfilled what we sought. A third element uh, that I would like to highlight is the climate law. Probably um, uh, one of the most important and most uh, and more political, uh, with the more political impact uh, decisions in during uh, the, the Portuguese presidency. Probably one of uh, one of the, the decisions that have more impact worldwide i mean some of the decisions that we take have only impact within the borders of the european union but this one uh, uh, is uh, is uh, uh, has a, a global impact and uh, and uh, enabled us to to participate in the earth summit that was uh, promoted by uh, the president biden in uh, in a in a stronger position of uh, of, uh, of a leading block i mean uh, because uh, after four years in which the, the EU led all this process alone, in, in a few months the, the, the US uh, uh, take, uh, took uh, important decisions and uh, the fact that we participated in that summit with the climate law already adopted, I think it was, uh, it was quite uh, important for the EU and uh, for, the position, uh, for the position of the EU in this, uh, in this uh, climate transition. Um, the, the summit with India and going back, going to a little bit to the external dimension. Uh, this is uh, uh, this this was uh, our uh, touch, if I may put it this way, in, in terms of uh, foreign policy. We have uh, organized an informal meeting of the leaders with the, the Prime Minister of India and with two uh, political rationals. One uh, is to, uh, is a, of course, a geostrategic move and to try to rebalance a little bit the relations between the EU and the two Asian giants. But also, and the second one uh, was to, to try to get a breakthrough on the economic between the EU and India that was uh, in a stalemate since uh, 2013. Um, and and on, on this second one, of course, uh, we we have a we have a, a positive outcome, uh, a, a, a trade agreement, negotiations for a trade agreement, an investment agreement, and an agreement on the, the protection of geographical indications will be launched uh, very soon. So. I think it's also worthwhile to highlight the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, it was uh, uh, blocked uh, back in December. Uh, uh, around the, it's something that happens many times in the in European Union that uh, we uh, we we get uh, blocked around the discussion on a name or who will be sharing the conference. Uh, I mean, we were able to 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 break through that. Uh, that that problem and uh, there was an agreement in February and, um, and the digital platform is uh, is uh, is working since April and uh, the the conference was formally launched in the on, in the 9th of May in Strasbourg uh, the, the, the day of Europe was a symbolic uh, moment and uh, the events and the works will start uh, this month in June uh, in all over Europe so this was also uh, I think uh, it's an important uh, Achievement on the digital, which is a very um, 
it's a huge dossier, very, very technical, but also very political. The Commission also only presented the, the proposal of the package uh, near Christmas in, uh, in the, back in December 2020. So we, we knew that we we're not going to close, uh, but we were able to, 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 to adopt several political declarations on, the, on responsible and democratic digital, on the digital platforms. And on the legislative processes, we, I think we have been able to make progress and to present progress reports, substantive progress reports, on the different files of the digital service package, uh, the digital markets uh, package, and also the Data Governance Act. So uh, this is uh, uh, this digital agenda, which I mean, the, the, in a way, the pandemic have, have, have done more for the digital agenda than many many legislative process, but I think we, we, we have made a good progress. And, um, um, and uh, going back to the UK, I mean, finally, I mean, we, we have been able in this semester to conclude the, the Brexit process. And the Brexit process took four years, it was like a sort of a, one of those good Netflix uh, series, I mean, in which uh, is tomorrow is the, is the next month and uh, and uh, it was a, a very complex and uh, and difficult process and finally uh, the entry into force of the trade and cooperation agreement uh, was uh, in, on the first of May uh, last month and uh, I mean a new phase uh, will now come on in. Uh, still in uh, in June uh, ahead of us I. I, I have more issues, but I, I don't have time. And uh, if, if maybe I, I, I give margin to the to the to the debate um, uh, in June, I would like to highlight. I mean, of course, the EU uh, US uh, summit uh, on the 14th of June. That is a, a very a very important political moment in this uh, semester. And um, um, and probably uh, I also would like to highlight that we still trying to close the. Another reform of um, uh, common agriculture, agriculture policy. Uh, we were about to finish it in the end of May. It was not possible. We are negotiating with the Parliament, but uh, we hope that by mid June we'll be able to do so. So uh, I would like to highlight these two events in in in, in June. Uh, but uh, I'm um, I'm available to to answer to any questions or to go into details in other areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy, for providing us with a very pertinent, comprehensive list of deliver deliverables of your presidency, but also uh, for putting it in a wider perspective, because the context is indeed very important. You said Portugal uh, is going to finish its fourth presidency. Uh, the Czech Republic is in one year time going to hold its second, historically second presidency. We all hope that by then it will not be anymore in the context of the pandemics. May I ask uh, Mr. Stepan Czerny uh, for his opening remarks and uh, possibly for sharing with us uh, information on priorities, focus, expectations, state of preparation, and so on. Mr. Czerny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. I would like to apologize, uh, Mela Hrdinková, who has to attend another event on the site of the Prime Minister, but I hope that. Uh, I will be able to provide uh, some input for the for subsequent debate uh, too. Uh, I will not be long. You know that the presidency. Well, it will be our second second presidency. It has been already mentioned a couple of times. What are the challenges of a post Lisbon and Lisbon? That's obviously the symbolical value of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which is present to us and it's the heritage of the last Portuguese presidency. Uh, uh, in our case, of course, uh, we are planning uh, for. Our presidency will come in the sort of a middle middle phase of the institutional cycle. That means that most of the presentations and most of the legislative proposals put forward by the European Commission will be already in a rather advanced or at least uh, not a preliminary legislative stage. That means that our presidency uh, is quite uh, judging its expectations towards its uh, dispositives and its opportunities. We know that even if uh, we civil servants among us uh, will try to explain the importance of the presidency to anyone uh, we meet. We still not know that the role of the presidency of the council is a rather managerial, uh, not a broker, somebody who makes sure that everything is done correctly and right, and that the interests of the member states in the council are well heard and they are well defended 
especially in the legislation with the, with the European Parliament. It's not up for the member states to impose its unilateral national domestic agenda on the European as European Union as whole. Even if it's somehow tempting to use the the the, the pulpit of the presidency to to teach the union some elements of our national priorities and what we deem important and that's that's perfectly fine i think that everybody has their own flair this was perfectly described by my uh, predecessor uh, what are the elements for to portugal wants to put forward for us uh, we have a specific situation of having the general elections uh, right before the hot phase of the presidency preparations will start it's uh, not something which we regret. This is the political life, which does not always follow the European institutional life. But we think that it's uh, still an like opportunity to have a to have, a, to have a, uh, more of an agenda-driven presidency than to have a strong political presidency from the capital. Of course, the trio is an important element. The Portuguese are quite uh, lucky. To have uh, their partners, uh, which are heavily experienced European member states, such as Germany, and then a uh, very experienced Slovenian team joining them. In our case, uh, of course, uh, it's tempting to present the presidency as a tool for France to have a to have a really uh, a blast on the on the council floor. We are in close contact with the French administration. Of course, we know that the French electoral campaign somehow may overshadow what will be done during the the special second half of the french presidency and therefore leave a bit more on our plate but uh, speaking about different elements of the agenda which we would like to focus on it's not for us to uh, to know at the moment what do we force the legislative stage for every single proposal but of course the green deal package which will be presented on the fifth bit for 55 or the green deal implementation package will be presented on the 14th of july this year uh, will be in quite advanced legislative phase. That's true. Uh, that will mean that probably it will be up for the Czechs to conclude at least our negotiations with the European Parliament. And then, of course, this is what we will probably uh, put our uh, human resources towards to. Uh, then, uh, what other elements apart from Fit for 55? Uh, we think that uh, among the trio, we will be the one who will be pushing probably the most for further liberalization of the, of the single market. Uh, we are a bit worried that this agenda point is now being referred to as a as in passing that okay, if single market is cheap, you don't have to do anything about it. Uh, we just have to uh, make it uh, that it exists and is something which is uh, provided as a given fact. Uh, our lesson from the pandemic is that the single market was the first victim uh, which fell to the national anti-pandemic measures. In hindsight, it seems a bit worrying that uh, the member states were eager to transgress European law on, uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, of course, a noble, noble, noble goal that means protecting their nation, their nations uh, from, the, from the infection from the pandemic. But on the other hand, we are a bit worried that the implications of the uh, economic interdependence between European member states were not taken into account. And this is something which should be, of course, raising during our presidency uh, then speaking about uh, the uh, some some other some other agendas we think that we will be probably the ones who will have to do something on the uh, migration pact uh, we know that the portuguese uh, portuguese presidency and i think it was a wise decision did not try to conclude the still quite brand new pact during their their time uh, for slovenian presidency i think they will have a lot of lot of thinking to do to do on this agenda file but we think that still we can contribute a bit to, the, to, this, to this debate. Uh, at, this, at the moment, so we don't really perceive that there is a strong majority in the council to move the file in one or other directions. That leads it probably to the Czech presidency to try to achieve uh, uh, some, some breakthrough on these negotiations. And then uh, referring to some, uh, some not that much politically sexy, if I may uh, call agendas, but something which are very important for us. Uh, these are, for instance, in the environmental agenda, not only uh, a green deal happens in the environmental file, but also elements of uh, biodiversity strategy and then a very specific element, which is the fight against light pollution. Uh, we know that this is something that probably you don't, that doesn't really step up into your mind when we are speaking about European environmental policy, but I think that it's time to, to revisit this 
this, this, this issue, it has huge consequences for not only the Green Deal, but also the, the well-being of citizens, also the biodiversity file and the upkeep of our of, of our uh, environmental environmental standards. Uh, then again, about specific events during our presidency, uh, we are, as has been the tradition since the Brexit referendum 2016, we are planning to have a summit of heads of states and governments, uh, probably in Prague, well, most likely in Prague. Uh, at the moment, we are still negotiating and reflecting whether to have a summit EU plus or EU only. I think the EU plus format, as the Portuguese presidency did with uh, India, is a quite uh, quite a welcome welcome addition. It's true that uh, the obvious uh, EU plus summit, such as EU and Eastern Partnership, will be quite difficult to organize. So we are looking into other options of other external partners. And then again, uh, to to conclude, I think that the Portuguese presidency is a good example of how a country of a middle size, such as the Czech Republic can manage to have a successful presidency. We were inspired uh, back in 2007 also, not only for political priorities, but also for the rather, uh, rather I would say, uh, common sense logistics and not uh, pompous events, which would take place all over the place, but who are, uh, events which are uh, which are concrete, which have specific deliverables and specific outcomes. And uh, that's why we are uh, quite inspired also for this uh, Portuguese presidency. I think it's a bold move that the Portuguese presidency moved to having in-person meetings already in May and in June, and we are looking forward to have some lessons learned also how to tackle uh, a potential post-pandemic presidency where travel may be still quite uh, quite limited. So thank you. Thank you, Stepan. Thank you very much. It's uh, quite a heavy agenda, and uh, thank you for providing us with the uh, uh, more and more details uh, that, uh, so that we uh, have a much, much clearer picture of what to expect from the Czech presidency. Thank you. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Bruno Messange, former or, or rather president uh, state, uh, state secretary uh, for European Affairs of Portugal. Mr. Messange, what are your views? Thank you, Dana. Uh, thank you to the ambassador, Ahmed Sampaio, for his invitation and also the co-organizers in Prague. Uh, very honored and flattered to be in this uh, distinguished company today. Uh, I want to start by by, by praising the, the Portuguese presidency for for, for a, a second. And please, um, my Czech friends, this is not self-praise because I was part of a government supported by very different political parties. And it's actually not easy to praise the minister and all his team in Lisbon um, if you're part of politics and the political process. But I think it was a very successful presidency. In a very difficult moment. When I talked to people involved in preparing the presidency back in November, December, they told me that this was going to be an unusual presidency, much more executive, because you had to deliver on a number of executive files. You had to make sure that uh, the delay that existed in procuring vaccines, and I've been critical of that delay, I think it goes back to decisions taken in the summer of 2020, but that that delay could be corrected and it was corrected and we're now finally in june having full access to vaccines uh, almost for everyone at this point in, in in most european countries there was of course also the recovery plan make sure that the own resources decision was taken we now know that some recovery plans are going to be approved i believe next week so just in time for for the end of the presidency there was a specific urgency in finishing these two files before the summer also, the COVID certificate, uh, just as important. Uh, and so not only was it a, a very successful presence from what I think is my impartial point of view, uh, not having been part of it of preparation and in fact, uh, being being part of a very different government in the past. But I think it was also a presidency that in a way inaugurates a different time for the EU. Uh, it was already in a sense, the first post COVID presidency. In the sense, COVID is not over yet, but in the sense that what COVID brought about, the changes that it brought about, was already something that the Portuguese presidency had to deal with and had to address. And those uh, changes were, I think, connected to the idea of a more executive EU, a EU that is no longer limited to providing a stable framework of rules, but a EU that has to take decisions in time and has to deliver results in time, a EU that exists in time much more than a EU that exists outside time, providing 
permanent uh, rules for economic activity. Is this a temporary change or does it actually show us what the future is going to be like? And I think it does show us what the future is going to be like. When I look back to the past few months, uh, what I see is that member states have become more demanding, not less demanding. Let's look at the vaccines. Um, I think the majority view in almost all member states was that the EU had to do better uh, when it came to vaccine procurement. Not that the EU was exceeding its competence uh, or was involved in areas that it shouldn't be. Clearly, the vast majority of people thought that the EU should be in charge of vaccine procurement for very good arguments that we don't have to go into, but connected to the uh, uh, to the single market and, and to its uh, preservation and, and prosperity. But so most people, vast majority of people agree that the EU should be in charge of the file. They thought that that the work had to be better, uh, had to be the flaws had to be corrected and so on as they were. Uh, and in many other cases, also the recovery plans, what we saw was member states being more demanding. They want more from the EU, not less. So, in fact, the last 10 years, let's say from 2010, the beginning of the Eurozone crisis to, to the end of Brexit, the mood was how do we fight populism? And perhaps we have to present an image of the EU as being a rather modest affair, uh, not in any way uh, leading to a reduction of sovereignty in, in national capitals. I think the mood has changed uh, with COVID. Uh, now the EU has to be able to show that it can deliver. Uh, member states are very demanding. Uh, they want results and they want the EU to deliver. That's a different intellectual and political world from the last 10 years, uh, where in fact many member states were tempted by the idea that they didn't need the EU. And we didn't see that at all in the past uh, year. COVID clearly created a much more unpredictable world where rules are less dominant, uh, where many rules are abrogated or forgotten. We've seen that with uh, medical equipment, we've seen that with vaccines, but we're now in the middle of a very serious crisis in access to semiconductors, and that will continue for another year. So global markets are in turmoil in large measure as a result of COVID, and they will continue in turmoil. And in this environment, we need a more executive EU more ready to take decisions, uh, more ready to be competitive in the global arena. And I anticipate that these changes will continue and will be visible in future presidencies. Uh, my best wishes to, to the Czech presidency. It was uh, really interesting and encouraging uh, to hear um, uh, the idea that we have to um, uh, recover the strength of the single market uh, and go to those areas where it was to some extent compromised during COVID and, and recover that strength. And we have to adapt to, to the new times. Uh, it's a world where rules are slightly less important. We have to accept that. Uh, and since I don't have political responsibilities, I think I'm freer to say this. It's a much more cutthroat competition, global competition and where rules will sometimes be forgotten by the main actors. And the EU has to um, adapt to these new circumstances. It's a world where technology is a lot more important. Big lesson from COVID. Imagine where we would be without the vaccines. Now imagine many other potential crises in our future, and we have to be prepared in advance. And our best weapon is technology to fight the climate crisis as well. So we need a EU that is turned towards technology, I know this is the view in Prague as well. I've been following a little bit of the debate on the digital files, and I know that the Czech Republic has been a very insistent and loud voice saying we need to be friendly towards technological innovation and we cannot afford to limit that in Europe. So again, to conclude, uh, we have entered um, a different world uh, and we need to think about how the EU has to respond. Uh, one final note, uh, the ministers didn't talk about this and didn't come up. Uh, uh, we are also in the middle of discussing whether uh, votes on foreign policy should should drop the unanimity rule and move towards qualified majorities. Well, you know, my argument today has been we need a EU that responds faster, uh, more executive EU. So my view is we need something like that and in other areas too. Might be a topic of discussion for the Conference on the Future of Europe. It's certainly a topic of discussion for many EU councils. 
and perhaps we'll hear about it today. Uh, but we don't need we need more Europe, but but also not just more European abstract, but a more executive European Union, a more geopolitical European Union. Again, my, my best wish is to uh, to our Czech friends as they prepare for 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 the presidency. Uh, and it's uh, excellent to see the two countries uh, working so closely together. Um, the, the EU is not only about the German French uh, engine. Uh, it's about what's to the west of the German French uh, engine and what's to the east of the German French engine. And uh, no better countries than, than Portugal and Czech to to draw that bridge that cuts right across uh, the, the the two main uh, countries in, in all these political discussions. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Hope to participate in the discussions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bruno. Thank you for all your interesting reflections. There are many on which I would like to come back to within the, uh, in the framework of the discussion. However, before we do that, uh, I can see that uh, Deputy Minister Jan Kohout has joined us. Uh, Deputy Minister Kohout, welcome. Uh, and thank you for re being with us despite your very very busy agenda. So if I uh, may give you the floor from the straight, just to recapitulate a little bit, we have discussed uh, achievements of the Portuguese presidency, the wider context, uh, plans. Uh, Mr. Cheney from the Office of the Government highlighted the uh, uh, context and, and, and preliminary priorities of the Czech presidency. And uh, you had the opportunity to uh, listen to uh, Bruno Mestaus, if I'm not mistaken. You were here all the time. So Mr. Coho, Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon uh, to all. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to join this uh, conference. I was uh, listening carefully to our ministers of foreign affairs, and uh, that was very inspiring discussions and the statements, I have to say. And um, first of all, and big gratitude goes to uh, Ambassador Sampaio for organizing this, uh, this conference. I think it was said many times uh, that um, uh, the Portugal and the Czech Republic are middle-sized countries in the EU, and I think it's an important characteristic. And uh, I think that they have a special responsibility in the EU, the countries like us, in uh, balancing the, the inside EU, because we know very well that the large countries sometimes tend to push forward the, their own agenda, labeling it as a European one. So we, as the middle-sized and small countries, are really um, devoted to the European cooperation and to balance the European cooperation. So uh, we have this special kind of responsibility, which was clearly delivered, I would say, by the Portuguese presidency in the first half of this year. And we are really grateful how they were navigating the, all the dossier, and especially for the breakthrough uh, of your presidency, of the Portuguese presidency, which was achieved in the interinstitutional negotiations, yeah, the launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe. That it would not be possible without the Portuguese contribution. And it's once again that a small or medium sized country is so important in uh, breaking or trying to find a solution. So I think that's one of the most important things to have all the time in mind that we are countries which are looking for the European solutions, not for the national looking like the Europeans. We are true Europeans and there is a true uh, devotion to find the European solutions. As I mentioned, the conference on the uh, future of the Europe, uh, that's important and uh, we know all that it's a reflection of the crisis or the Brexit and some other crisis. So we have to reflect uh, very uh, thoroughly and deeply and to listen to the people what they are willing. From my point of view, and I take it as a small contribution to that debate already, I would stress three words. And one, the first one is freedom, the second one is democracy, and the third is subsidiarity. Subsidiarity in the EU, so the people are at the same time as, my, uh, as the previous speaker said that they are expecting a lot from the EU, uh, EU level, but at the same time, 
they are willing to have the let's say the destiny of their own in their own hands in the uh, at least for them uh, in the uh, size of the city region country and uh, i don't agree too much with what was said about the vaccination i think that was a uh, set view looking at the leaders of the eu sitting for many many hours just discussing how 10 millions of vaccines would be distributed by the half a billion of citizens. So I think that there must be a uh, lesson learned, reflection, so how make the EU level and the European Commission. As regards and coming back from this, uh, let's say, thoughts, which are more or less personal, so I would like to mention some of the priorities which are uh, ahead of us and you know, what we have the so let's say formulated for us for the presidency in the area of foreign foreign affairs and foreign relations so uh, of course this uh, we can prepare ourselves for uh, all possibilities but at the at the at the last moment will arrive something else so for us it's important to have the flexible preparations to cover all the things which can appear. But for the moment, we are focusing, as was said, for a strong, resilient and sustainable Europe. That are the aims which covers all the, let's say, the aspects of the uh, foreign, uh, foreign performance of the EU. Those are those horizontal, would say, the uh, horizontal priorities but we have also this geographic was set in the first part, but I would like to stress that for us, it's important the Western Balkans and the reforms in Western Balkans countries, which can uh, bring them much closer and also in the process of the accession to the, to the EU. Second one is the European neighborhood, a neighborhood of Europe in all the dimensions. And the third one is the Indo Indo Pacific Indo Pacific uh, uh, region, where we see the, one of the biggest challenges uh, for the Europeans being in the EU and being in members of the of the NATO. So, so the future on, uh, of Europe is also linked to that to that in the Pacific region, and we have to be uh, quite active in that area and to have the much more let's say, uh, proactive uh, approach than was than was before and not to uh, the most important ally for us all in Europe, that means the United States, to leave them, leave them uh, alone. So, with that, you will, we will provide you in time. We are working on the TRIO, TRIO program, so you, probably you were informed. So we will fine tune uh, our priorities just before, but we are, as I said, we try to be ready for all the possibilities which can appear, but at the end, we probably will be surprised by <laughs> any kind of type I like with this COVID. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Koho. Thank you for 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 your perspective, and also thank you for uh, giving the uh, focusing uh, in more detail on the foreign policy priorities of the of the Czech, uh, Czech Republic and its uh, upcoming presidency. Uh, may I ask uh, whether any speaker would like to react to their fellow uh, speakers' remarks before I uh, ask my prepared questions? It doesn't seem to be case. Okay, so I will, I will, I will go immediately. Uh, many of you have mentioned the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, here, my question would be uh, whether you could be, be have, and we have heard uh, it also in the previous contributions. Uh, Minister Kulhanek said that citizens, uh, it should be citizens rather than institutions that uh, should be uh, in the focus, and that it will be only as successful if it addresses the citizens' concerns. May I ask uh, whether uh, any of you would like to elaborate more on the national expectations? from this process? Uh, Mr. Chen. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. A very good question. It can be summed up that our approach to the conference 
have been uh, have been judged by some to be to be also quite a uh, modest or uh, not to have the opening of the treaties as a, at the forefront of our thinking, but that's basically the consequence of our expectations and the, the limited knowledge, but still some knowledge that we have about the uh, Czech citizenry, what they may or may not be able to 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 uh, to include in the conference on the future of Europe. Our approach is mainly uh, policy oriented. That means that we will try to learn from the citizens who will take part in our in the in the different elements of the conference of the future of, of, uh, of Europe, uh, what they think the EU should do more, whether they think that there are areas where the EU should do less, and uh, whether the uh, these policies are uh, somehow somehow linked to what uh, they expect of from the government to do, because well that's uh, very relevant to what uh, Vice Minister Poho said that we still have to be sure that we do not over estimate what the EU can deliver. Of course, the competences of the EU or competences of any institution are extremely limited. So we probably, some, or we can, we can expect that some citizens will try uh, to give the EU the tasks which it's not definitely suited to do, such as the pension reform or things like that, which we don't really expect the EU to deliver. And then based on this consultation process, we will try to formulate whether we can achieve these uh, these aims within the within the framework of the treaties, or whether that's not the case, and this will basically provide for for our our national position. Uh, one element which is also quite, I would say, not not not, not really unique, but uh, uh, it's not very very uh, it's not very common among the member states is that we offer the platform of the Conference on the Future of Europe to any civil society organization to organize their own events. It's not only the government will be providing. Uh, providing platforms or providing uh, events where people will have to go. But if a trade union, if an NGO, if a school or a municipality or a church or any such an informal group of people want to organize their own event, where people from probably from areas which would be difficult to reach from the central central level uh, want to take part in debate, of course they're more more than welcome, and they are fully uh, fully expected. Uh, they can fully expect that they are there. Contributions will be taken into account, and this is how we will formulate our 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 national national debate. So we try to have a more bottom up approach, not to start with the premise. Okay, we want to reform the EU from the up. So that means that we need to make sure that Spitzenkandidaten are this or that, or they are that many commissioners, or they are uh, that many uh, qualified majority votings uh, per day or per month or per year. I don't think that the people of the Czech Republic actually know these things or are at all interested on in how many. Uh, how many commissioners are there, or there are not? Uh, and this, this, uh, this is so. I think our approach is more bottom up to be to be more in touch with what the people actually expect the EU to to deliver for them. Thank you. We go immediately uh, to the Portuguese camp first, Mr. Uh, Messange, and then uh, Mr. Vinas. Yes. Well, as, as someone who is not involved in the process and who is not involved in politics or policy anymore, who deals on a daily basis with either business people or with intellectuals and, and journalists, as is my case now, I have to say that there, I don't see a lot of interest in the conference so far. And you know, this should be registered by by the organizers, and there should be an effort to appeal more to citizens. There should be an effort, as the Czech minister said very well. Deliver, deliver, deliver. I think it's a sentence I, I retained from his speech and in the previous panel. Uh, how to deliver to citizens? Uh, there should be a reflection about the new times that we have entered. How does the new the EU need to adapt to the new times uh, after COVID, but also after the trade wars, the rise of China, and all these big changes from the past few years? And finally, I think it would be excellent if the EU was able to be self critical, uh, recognize where, where things have not worked well. That would be, I think, applauded by citizens if there was a, a genuine effort to do this. I think the vice minister had some critical words, as I understood him, about the vaccines. I entirely joined that. Uh, I've been very critical in public in texts that I've published about how the vaccine procurement process uh, was uh, initially uh, conducted. Um, I think the EU had trouble adapting to a situation that is so different from its DNA. Uh, procuring vaccines was not about creating rules. It was not about establishing a legal framework. It was about being fast and making decisions very fast. So we have to understand that the EU needs to adapt to these new circumstances. Uh, I think some mistakes have been corrected, but the ability to be self-critical is important. And 
if, if there's an effort to do that in the conference, I think it would be very, very uh, uh, good for, for the process. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vignosh. Yeah, um, thank you. A view from Lisbon is, uh, is, is, is very much similar to the, to the Czech one and, uh, and also to the one of uh, Bruno Massais. We, we look into the conference uh, uh, as, um, as an opportunity uh, to discuss um, the present and the future and to try to listen to people and to, and, uh, to get uh, answers to the, to, to the people, to those to hopes, problems, uh, fears and concerns of the Europeans. That is uh, the way. That is why we, um, we have always, and now as presidents, we are basically an honest broker and we have tried to, to, to fix the, the stalemate where we stand back in December. But nationally, uh, we very much against uh, that this presidency will be a, that this conference will be a, co uh, a place to discuss uh, revision of treaties or to embark in a, a institutional discussions. We think that this should be basically policy driven and uh, and to try to to address real problems and real uh, real issues of the European Union. We have the agenda is there. I mean, we know. Which are the big challenges? So, and I'm very happy that uh, we will share this vision, and, the, and that the, the motto of the Portuguese presidency delivered is uh, is uh, is uh, was a timely one, and, uh, and is because it's basically what the EU needs now: uh, respond, uh, the capacity of, re of responding, and to, to deliver to to the, the concrete uh, uh, problems of of the Europeans, uh, and this is a. Uh, what I wanted to, to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have a related question, unless uh, Deputy Minister, okay, Kohout would like to react as well. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. And I agree with what was said regarding the uh, discussion on the institutional setup of the EU. I remember quite well when I was the member of the Czech delegation to the Convention on uh, Constitution for Europe and all those lengthy discussions leading to the to the Lisbon Treaty and the others. So I don't think that it's the right time for any type of such a discussion. So we have really to focus, but I wouldn't exclude in the future. So after this conference, maybe we will see. So what was said by Mr. Cheney that we can maybe in the future to reflect, but for the moment, it would be a uh, threat in which we can easily lose uh, the time and the money. As regards the conference and such, it's important and it's uh, important to attract the, the the people. But you know, I feel some um, uh, some. I explain. On one side, we are discussing and telling the let's express your visions about the future. That's on what the conference would be about. On the other. We have the recovery plan and the, the monument depths for the future exactly telling where those money are going. Yeah, so what kind of that's the uh, um, non carbon economy, uh, green technologies, dig digitalization, all those kind of things. So <laughs> it's already set where the EU is going, what it's going to do, and where are they, where the EU is putting the money, the future money, not the current money. So the space, in fact, for reflections, what we would like to all the people. So it's very narrow, in fact, so we do not, we are not giving too much space for, let's say, dreams, visions, or some revolutionary visions. So we prepare the future for them by our other plans. So that's my only, let's say, the remarks, take it as a personal one, because I am serious in thinking and I don't want to have the another conference discussing some nice speeches leading to nowhere, some, some nice gatherings. So there must be something for the EU, for the citizens, for the member states which will give us the chance to survive the EU in a future which is going to be much worse, as I expecting, than current days. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Dana, yeah. Dana, may I? I, I? I don't resist in making a comment, but thank you very much. It was very enlightening, very interesting, especially uh, for me, uh, the part related to the Conference on the Future of, um, uh, of Europe. It is an opportunity not to be missed. It is really a golden opportunity to reach out to younger audiences. Uh, one of the perceptions that we very often uh, cannot avoid in our diplomatic dwellings is that there is a disconnect between what is being discussed uh, in Brussels by the politicians, by the governments, and then the wider debate for more uh, young audiences. When I talk to university students uh, across the Czech Republic, as I did in uh, different uh, countries in my previous posting, postings, there is a, a difference, a marked difference of perception between generations. And we need really to learn the lessons from that. And if there is something that we need to avoid after the pandemic, is that the, is, is to allow the pandemic to widen the gap between generations. We need really to work, all of us, in order to narrow uh, that gap. And the Conference on the Future of Europe is an opportunity also to do that, at least an opportunity to modestly contribute to uh, that, uh, that, uh, that debate. It is one of the of the scenes of the European project is uh, alienating uh, a lot uh, of young uh, people uh, from the crucial European debate. And then the other one was pointed out by the ministers themselves when they said that it is very easy and also very often the case for governments to blame Brussels, to blame the European institutions when anything goes wrong in our countries and also to praise and to uh, try to to, to build uh, on the loyals when uh, anything goes right, forgetting very often also to give credit to the functioning of the European institutions. And what we saw about solidarity throughout the crisis, what we saw about vaccination, uh, even if I take on board the critics that were made uh, about uh, some of the procurement I mentioned, all in all, uh, we really need to, to praise the way the European institu institutions function and are, are functioning in order to help us out of the crisis uh, uh, created by the pandemic. So uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe is a, is a, good, a golden opportunity not to be missed to foster that wider uh, political debate about Europe. And I am sure that the next panel especially because of its composition and uh, of its generation differences, will also provide a very good opportunity for us to, to discuss further these issues. Thank you, Dana, for intervening, but I could not resist, I could not help in making this, uh, this comment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ish. I think you, you raised a very important uh, issues and actually uh, the, the perception of the EU. And actually, uh, over the time of this conference, we have heard uh, how much uh, both countries have in common. But if there is an area where I think that both the member states, Portugal and the Czech Republic, are uh, differing, I would say, strikingly, it's the perception of the EU. Because uh, if you look at the figures of the latest Eurobarometer, uh, although in the Czech Republic, who is known or has been for a long time uh, in the rather Eurosceptic front, uh, the figures have been rising up, but we are still not at the levels of those Portuguese. If I take a look, uh, uh, for instance, trust in the European Union, uh, in the Czech Republic, we have 48% uh, uh, of citizens trusting uh, the EU, whilst in Portugal we have 74%. Uh, uh, how much are you attached uh, to the European Union? In uh, in the Czech Republic, 53% uh, of uh, respondents said yes, while in Portugal it's 78. So very simple question to our uh, panelists. Why is that so? Well, if I can start very quickly as a political philosopher by training, uh, I think the, the history of the two countries is different. Um, it's been pointed out, for example, by Ivan Krastev. I think uh, he, he's right about this. 1989 for the Czech Republic and for many countries in Central and Eastern Europe was, in fact, 
the affirmation, a strong affirmation of the Czech nationality against uh, a Soviet empire that was, in a way, trying to move beyond nationality and using uh, brute force to, to bring that about. Uh, for us in Portugal, the story was, of course, very different. For us, uh, our revolution in 1974 was, in a way, the opposite. We had a very strong nationalistic narrative uh, connected to empire that had to be corrected and was corrected in, in large part by appealing to a European identity. So history is important. I'm sure there are factors that are more recent, but we have to keep in mind that there are structural forces here that explain why the two countries, so close in many respects, do have different histories. Thank you, Bruno. Any other reaction? Yeah, I, I was only about, if I might, to, to mention uh, Jan Patochka and your philosophy of uh, dissidence, which is, in my mind, always a very important element when uh, it comes to try to read the uh, Czech idiosyncrasy. Uh, I mean, the ministers also referred, uh, the Portuguese minister referred to the to the two revolutions, to the comparison between the two revolutions, and the Bruno Massange uh, also uh, just did that. It, it, it is very interesting. Uh, we need to understand the Czech uh, uh, perceptions about the European Union integration, also in the light of exactly what Bruno Massange referred to. We need to, to reread uh, Charter 77, to go back to fundamentals, and to understand that in many aspects, the heritage from President Václav Havel, and of course, behind him, the, the huge shadow of Jan Patochka, uh, are, are not yet fully ingrained uh, in certain age groups in the Czech Republic. But that is my personal opinion. The observation of a foreigner uh, generously uh, living in the Czech Republic, I don't know what my Czech friends think about that. Uh, Deputy Minister Kohout, uh, Mr. Uh, Chen, you uh, yeah, react to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, very difficult question, yeah, so, which is related, deeply rooted in the, as was said already, in the history of this, uh, different history of the countries. So I think that this part of Europe, the Central Europe, went through uh, different types of occupation in the last, uh, let's say, 70, 80 years, the Nazi occupation and uh, belonging to the to the Russia Empire. And uh, the, after what was mentioned with Václav Havel and the Charter 77 and this revolution, well, with the revolution, so uh, that was about the freedom, uh, and mainly about the freedom mm -hmm. in all aspects, yeah. speech and movement and all aspects. Because in the empire was one through which was delivered from one center and there was no space for any kind of discussion. So by definition, by definition, the Czechs are so quite sensitive to any type of so losing this freedom which they were fighting for so many years. So when they were uh, so managed from the outside, so they were uh, there was they were told that what they should think and what should do and what to think about this one or that one. So and this is still alive, yes. Yeah? So that's alive this experience from the past totalitarian state, and it's still alive the the heritage of Václav Havel. So that's the mixture, and the other we said, in my view, is the explanation for the, for the on one side growing support and feeling that we need EU or the European cooperation. On the other, not easily so digesting everything what is coming and having still the critical, critical thinking. And the critical thinking is one of the main advantages of our Western civilization, no other civilizations or the spaces have such a critical thinking when they are checking all the time what they are doing because they they need, they know that it's the only way forward for the progress in any type of the of the human activity. So that's my explanation. So my feeling of that. So 
is telling something about us and uh, would be, of course, more uh, so satisfied if the, but uh, as you said, the, the numbers are growing. So let's hope that this conference on future of Europe will make some health sense more than it was nowadays. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this topic is uh, making a nice bridge towards the next panel because uh, and which is going to I'm, I'm very sure elaborate on that and uh, we will be e eagerly listening to it. So uh, this is uh, this is this is the opportunity to give a uh, last final uh, chance for our speakers uh, whom I would like to thank you. Thank them very much for, for participating. But before uh, uh, saying goodbye to them, uh, can I ask whether anybody else would like to Say a few words at the at the end of our panel. Uh, I just want to thank the organizers again. I, I learned a lot already, and looking forward to to the other panels so with younger people. As the ambassador always insists, uh, important to listen to them. Congratulations on the initiative, also to you, Donna, and best of luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on the, on, on, just on the same on the same line, just to thank you very much and uh, to Louise Alvarez Sampai and the organizers uh, and also to you, Dana, for, for for the moderation. Thank you very much. It was very useful for me as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to our to our speakers who uh, were uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, Mr. Jan Kohout, uh, Rui Vinyash, Director General for European Affairs of Portugal, Stepan Czerny from the Office of the Government of the Czech Republic, and uh, Bruno Messange, former Secretary of State of European Affairs of Portugal. Thank you very much. It was also my pleasure, and I hand over the floor to Luis Tampaio. Thank you very much, Rana. Thank you for, for your very professional impeccable uh, moderation. I think it was a very rich uh, panel that uh, created uh, not only the continuum uh, after the first uh, uh, high-level ministerial panel, but also opened everybody appetite uh, for uh, more intellectual, academic, think tank related, and probably uh, I would dare to say more uh, free-floating uh, kind of discussion that we are approaching now with the last panel uh, of our conference. Uh, we are going to have a very professional and proficient uh, moderator, uh, but before I, I hand over the floor to, to him to conduct the debate and to distribute the, the cards, uh, let me uh, mention a couple of things that I think are uh, absolutely uh, indispensable to, to set the scene. As I said, uh, we are going to have uh, uh, very prominent academics, intellectuals, uh, thinkers about the European project from both countries. But uh, one of the traits, and I uh, like very much to insist on that, is that we are going to have different generations. Uh, we are going to have uh, representatives of the very inception uh, of the European Union integration, European communities uh, at the time of the Portuguese integration, and we are going to have Professor Emmanuel Porto uh, talking about that uh, and about his own experience as a long-standing member of the European Parliament. But, uh, but I need to say that Professor Porto uh, uh, is not only a very good friend of mine, but he was also my teacher at the Coimbra University from the very beginning of my studies of law. He was my, my, my professor of uh, political, political economics, um, and we kept uh, uh, throughout uh, an excellent personal and professional relationship. Uh, we have also with us from uh, more or less uh, that generation, uh, uh, Miroslava, uh, uh, we have Miroslava Kopichova that was in the government, uh, uh, more than once uh, in the in the Czech Republic, uh, she also she is also very well known from the European uh, circles and political and intellectual circles in, in the Czech Republic, uh, and both of them, uh, Professor Porto and 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 uh, Miss Kopichova, uh, they represent uh, uh, really the uh, generation of those that know what it takes to put. Portugal and the Czech Republic within the European institutions and as part and parcel of the European project. 
then uh, we are going to have Enrique Bonnet, uh, also a very good friend of mine and the director of the most prominent uh, lobby institution that is dealing on a daily basis with European institutions. And it is very important to have someone like Enrique Bonnet with us today because he's not a diplomat, he's not a parliamentarian, he's not a politician. Sometimes he has uh, some uh, what caustic uh, look uh, about the European institutions, but we need that. We need exactly the view that Enrique Bonnet will be able, like nobody else, to provide to this uh, debate of ours today. Uh, Thomas Weiss uh, will uh, also be in tandem with him, more or less of the same generation, an academic, and I, I, I profit from mentioning Thomas Weiss to say that we owe a lot to the Carolina University, one of our main partners throughout this cycle of conferences, and we, we are eager to listen from, from, from Thomas uh, Weiss. Then we are uh, going to have uh, uh, younger people with us, uh, Sebastian Bugani, one of the brightest, very young uh, Portuguese, not only uh, political scientists, but also journalists. Uh, you will not say that, but I, I, I can say on his, uh, on his behalf that the Portuguese president very often calls on Sebastian to listen to him, to learn from him, and to be more acutely aware about the concerns of his generation and what uh, the uh, Portuguese uh, European uh, Union affairs are concerned. Uh, and then uh, we have with us uh, Susana uh, Sturzlikova, uh, uh, a very dear friend of mine. Uh, you probably know that uh, Susana represents also uh, European another of our main partners and the only uh, Czech think tank that is also based or at least has a very prominent representation in Brussels. And uh, uh, when I was preparing to come to the Czech Republic, to the ambassador to Prague, Susanna uh, was uh, uh, the first person helping me out. So a lot of the things I say about the Czech Republic, uh, the responsibility is directly from, uh, from uh, Susanna that I gladly recognize to be here with us today. We have also, as a complementarity to this uh, panel of ours, uh, Hian Mahacek, very well known in the Czech circles, the head of uh, uh, our very important uh, partner, the Institute for Politics and, and Society, that is with us today to share the panel that will be very uh, adeptly uh, uh, moderated by Andre uh, Uska, uh, journalists for, journalist for one of the most important uh, uh, daily Czech newspapers. Without any further ado, I will give the floor to Andre, uh, but I already warned him that uh, if I don't resist to jump on the discussion, uh, I will not refrain from doing that. Andre, please, the floor, the moderation, of this very important panel is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, again, uh, as mentioned already, I'm Andrzej Hoska, journalist with Czech newspaper Hospodářské noviny. I wish you all uh, good afternoon and welcome to the last uh, panel of our conference, which will try to share the insights of three generations of Portuguese and Czechs deeply involved in EU affairs, as Mr. Ambassador mentioned at the at the beginning i will not do the introductions it's it's it has already been done so let me uh, start uh, straight away with a question to uh, miroslava kopicova if she's with us okay yeah i am here excellent uh, miroslava kopicova former minister director of the national training fund um, you have many years of experience with dealing with the EU since it started to be possible in the Czech context, if I may say so. So uh, reflecting on this, when you look at the EU now, uh, are you satisfied with how it's working? What would you change perhaps? Since we've talked also about the conference on the future of Europe, whose aim is also to, to come up with ideas uh, how to change the EU, not only, but uh, this is also an important part. So what would be 
your comment to that? Well, um, it was, first of all, it's uh, wonderful to be part of this discussion, especially in this generation panel. I very much appreciate it and thank you very much, uh, Excellency, to invite me. Yeah, I am a, a kind of um, historical note, <laughs> uh, if you take it that way. I exactly remember the first day when the word FARE has been pronounced as a financial instrument for pre accession period. And I'm still working on uh, many European issues. You know, since the beginning, uh, it, uh, we were absolutely delighted to start all these things. And our ambition in, in the Czech Republic was that everything will be done perfect. To be seen as the best uh, was what we wanted to do because for so many years we couldn't do anything. I was analyst, uh, analytic, working on employment issues, uh, but uh, only after the revolution suddenly I was one of you who spoke somehow English. So, uh, and uh, I was <coughs> entrusted to run one of the biggest European programs uh, under far uh, labor market restructuring and. It included, uh, first of all, to set up labor offices, labor, uh, proactive labor market policy, but also social policy, but uh, management development, uh, education programs, etc. It was a big, uh, wonderful time when we had uh, from many European countries advisors, we had money uh, for <laughs> our bureaucracy meant that we had one list one list uh, where they set out how we should use the money and that was all only later on there was a book about procedures and so on but in the beginning no and uh, here uh, we understood that we were um, responsible to set to set up uh, many new policies uh, and uh, as a portuguese minister said but uh, the the problem uh, is uh, many times in delivery. And he reminded me to one of the best projects we have, and it was about uh, a, public a public administration reform. Uh, and in charge of advisors uh, were Isabella Corterial. She was responsible for Portuguese reform of public administration. And in that time, she was director of Maastricht Institute, uh, who actually trained uh, uh, civil servants in the commission. Uh, wonderful, but uh, you know how it was uh, with uh, civil service reform, M much later uh, without any time, et cetera, et cetera. But if you ask me, so this was the first time we really started to invite the best people for all the projects I have. I uh, set up so-called advisory task force. It meant that uh, all the relevant experts in the field were invited to discuss with us the project, to say if we do it well or what should be done, because we wanted them as many as possible to have them on our board. And that's why these programs were so smooth. Of course, later on, we were quite uh, tired because uh, it lasts for years uh, before we entered the union. And, you know, before uh, with, with the pre-accession pre period, we were under ex-ante control. So um, we had to discuss with youngsters and we saw we are, and, and, and so. But anyway, then we enter and things uh, have changed. I had a chance to be twice uh, negotiating European Social Fund uh, with, with the Commission. And um, I see that uh, still there was kind of uh, a little bit hesitation to give us trust. But uh, then it's changed. And if you ask me now, of course, I see that um, many things didn't happen how we put it, but it's probably normal. But the progress we made was enormous, was enormous. And uh, we were inside that. <clears throat> and when I realized, for instance, that uh, under structure of funds, our country has the best infra infrastructure in research in the widest, uh, wider uh, approach, I mean, uh, through the whole country. It's something we would never, ever have. 
And uh, during our presidency also was interesting that uh, one of the key activities uh, which we concentrate besides these three E priorities was that, uh, you know, we couldn't recover from the economic crisis. And then we decided to invite uh, eight best people, scientists from Harvard, for instance, for nine, nine months, I led them to work and give us a study why our countries in Central Europe, why we don't par uh, participate in FP7 uh, as leaders of projects. And they made wonderful studies, which actually OECD took as a basis for, for their innovation strategy. And um, it showed that, uh, yes, <clears throat> our big institutions were somehow destroyed during uh, the transformation, and we didn't have capacity strong enough to compete for this big money in Europe. And this is uh, just, I mentioned this one example, because I think this is important. Sometimes, for instance, FP7 was designed by developed countries, old countries uh, in the Union, for their own, naturally, for, for their own institutions. But for us, it was difficult to, to join this. Uh, if you ask me what I would do differently in this case, of course, you know, if we came to the point that uh, in the beginning, it was a game, we were transforming and so on. Later on, it started to be a business. You know, and suddenly uh, when we support the enterprises, uh, I was responsible for management development and new, all these new programs supporting uh, the born enterprises here. So suddenly uh, it was slightly different, a little bit hesitation, but on the other hand, I had to say, okay, um, we are industrial country, we now complain that um, a lot of money through value chain goes to, uh, to um, uh, companies uh, which don't have uh, their own place here. Yes, that's true. But uh, what we do, and I am really proud of that, we start to deal with uh, Industry 0. Uh, 0. 0.4.0. We are trying now to support technical universities uh, and uh, try to prepare people which will be able to use this cut value chain, which probably comes. Um, and um, they will be able to profit more from all the production we are going to have. So this is one thing uh, we do, and I think it's important. Uh, of course, you know, sometimes we don't understand each other. With, uh, for instance, I ask in Germany, a leader of uh, their industrial uh, industry for zero. And I said, uh, we expect uh, you will bring back, because uh, the globalization meets its limits and so on, you will move your industries back uh, uh, what about the Czech Republic? And he uh, he told me, don't worry, we will not take anything from you. We are happy with you. It was completely different the question I raised. And that's why I see that uh, the more communication, the better. And, uh, you know, certain tensions which we have, for instance, in this case, uh, they are they can be moved because you know even Germany is short of engineers, even other countries in Europe. So uh, it's not that um, we will be only in this. Uh, of course, to sell products, it's a different story. This is what I've mentioned. But also the profitable parts in the beginning, the research and you know all these experiments and so are already given to the Czech Republic. Not only the middle part to make something. What uh, what is the sign? Um, so my my think uh, would be that on one side, what we can solve home, we should do. But the other thing, uh, you, we've uh, heard uh, the whole afternoon that uh, there are challenges which are over uh, possibilities of individual country. And I think it would be really strange if we are going to continue to dehonest European institutions, we should rather send our best people to participate in this context and uh, go ahead because this, without that, we are really not able to, um, uh, to solve these uh, difficulties as uh, environment, I mean, migration and uh, safety and so on. And uh, uh, His Excellency Ambassador 
very rightly mentioned the young generation. This is what we are very much rely on. For instance, I see we are not too good in a proportion of our uh, digital knowledge in, uh, in the population. But if you take the youngest, we have the quickest dynamic in Europe. So it means our generation, young generation, it's uh, different, but also uh, they already have understanding that this is their future and they understand we should behave more modest way. Uh, this rich life we had was probably the last. They have to care about others if they don't want them all here in Europe and if they don't want to destroy our, our whole model of our life. So uh, from my point of view, Europe is absolutely important. We have to support it, but we have to be clear that not everybody from this country can represent us. In, uh, in the European institutions as well. Not everybody can uh, decide about their country here home. So this was, this would be my, I am very much uh, in favor of Europe, very much so because I think uh, this is condition sine qua non for our life. Thank you very much for, for your introductory remarks. I forgot to remind uh, all of our panelists to be as brief as possible, since our time is quite limited. Yeah. You, you were right uh, on time, I would say, or you you took uh, the time you needed. That, that, that's fine. Now, let me uh, go to Manuel Porto, who's professor and who, who were there at the beginning, I would say, as someone involved in the Portuguese accession process to the EU. Uh, it was touched upon by Miroslava Kopicova as well, but. Bruno Masej a couple of minutes ago said that we need an EU that is more able to take decisions. Uh, Professor Porto, uh, do you think that we have such an EU already now or is there a room for an improvement? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. First word is to thank you very much for this opportunity to speak, but to follow all the people who have spoken before and also previous sessions very very interesting so congratulations for the initiative and i cannot avoid to in one minute to tell some very personal thinkings that i have just had i was born in this house in this room room just close to this so 78 years ago and the people say students the world is very bad is worse and so on uh, i don't believe i mr Ambassador spoke about different generations I am by far the oldest person in this session, but when I was born, were leaders of Europe, uh, some gentlemen called Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, Francisco Franco, and a professor of our school uh, called Oliveira Salazar. So to say that the things are worse, at that time, I was a boy just playing in this, so, uh, in this house, so uh, half of the Europe was... Uh, the other uh, last uh, very personal, so, uh, uh, mention I'd like is the following. In 59, I was studying German to go to uh, law. We had to make German and uh, came to this house, just to this house, a, a, a Catholic priest from Austria, from Österreich, Franz Feiertag. And he asked me in 59, so 62 years ago, Manuel, would you like to go to Austria? Yes, I said, well, if my father <laughs> let me go, okay. And I spent, uh, so for this one month and a half, without hearing a word in Portuguese, only German, in Filak, near the border with the former Yugoslavia, now uh, near Harkensdorf, near Angara, and near the Czech Republic. I could not imagine, so I am speaking about 62 years ago, that today, so this date, the 8th so of uh, June, so 2021, uh, I am speaking with you in the, your wonderful city, so things have moved, and they are not worse than before. This is what happened. And the, compared the two situations, when I could not go to Czech, at that time Czechoslovakia and so on and so on, I could not go, it was impossible. I have a granddaughter, sorry for remember that, that is today, now, the uh, Minister of Czech and Republic has mentioned the number of students in Erasmus of medicine, one of those students he has mentioned, not given the name, is one of my granddaughters who is studying there in your country. And he's very, very happy. I already told her to follow this session. So things have changed. 
Well, my remarks will be uh, short because we have not much time, but uh, just to remember that uh, we have a new world, so uh, uh, where things will change. In the last century, uh, the last half of the century, there was a dual uh, country with the United States and Soviet Union, politically, militarily, and so on and so on. There was the Cold War. There was the Triad, so at that time, with the states, Europe, and the world, and Japan, but of course, things will move. It is something unique in this of humankind, probably, that the two biggest countries of the world in population, China and India, are growing since 30 years ago, more or less, more than 7% each year. In the decade of the 90s, China did grow more than 10, uh, two digits, more than 10%. And so there will be a new world. And the, the person just spoke before me, we need Europe. So you have about 5% of the population. Up to now, we have had the biggest uh, GDP of the world, 2% more than states, with the Brexit, something uh, awful. Uh, so uh, they, they, they leave. Uh, we have a little bit less than states, but China will come up. And in the, sorry for giving to you another so uh, personal uh, uh, information. My wife is from India. My family is from India. I have more family in India. And also in China, I have in Macau, but it is different. A daughter and son-in-law and four grandchildren. But uh, so it is to see what will happen. People speak about the... Uh, so uh, I would like to mention this at the end, but I shall say that in the, the uh, presence of Portugal, lots of things were quite successful, I think. I'm very happy about it. But one of them, it was to make uh, that big uh, meeting in Porto about the social model of Europe. It is to prove that Europe with this model can compete. So I always say this when I speak, I go very often to Macau teaching to Chinese students and to say it is possible to have the European social model and to compete. We have by far, this is not mentioned, I'm very uh, sorry to do this. Mr. Stiglitz, former Nobel Prize, who wrote books against the euro. So Mr. Martin Wolf, who uh, studied in the same college as me, with the same supervisor in Oxford, I studied in Oxford uh, many years ago, and also never mentioned the surplus of the European Union, mainly the surplus of the euro area. So this is to prove that it is possible to, with democracy and with social model, right to have strikes and so on and so on, we have by far the biggest surplus of the world, biggest in China. So Europe, it is good for us. We make this because it's good for us. But it is a good example that it's possible to keep democracy, social model, and to compete all over the world. This is the best thing, the best contribution of Europe for all the world. It is this one. And it, well, I mentioned India, so coming to the <laughs> country of my wife, must prove that it's possible with 1.4 thousand million people. Within some years, 1.7, it is possible to have political democracy, not economic democracy, that it is also to stress, but in effect to keep democracies even in some countries. Just so two or three minutes more, because in Hebrew I have not more time, I would like very much to speak longer, but I cannot. Uh, so uh, uh, we had, uh, had the strategies of Europe, the Lism strategy, with the help of being the more efficient economy of the world, so uh, with too many objectives and so on. I always quote still now, I should say, the strategy Europe 2020, it remains quite updated. So with the challenge, which are there, so there are big challenges. So uh, already now, or so will be in the future. Uh, so globalization, aging of population, it is a case of country China and so on, and also the uh, resources. So we must pay attention. So beginning by the third point uh, about the resources, not to destroy them. I mean to have a development. So taking care of the resources about population, so there are problems in China with the aging of population, but it is about the globalization. And the point I would like to stress, so if you have time later, I can come back to it. If somebody puts any question, or if them, someone does disagree, I think that Europe has followed the right strategy. It would be the case when China is going up and so on and so on, that we would have in Europe, in the European Union, a protectionist policy. Happily, it is not the case. So it, it, the good example is about the average of uh, tariffs, it's 3.8, 36% of the imports come to European without tariffs. The good example is not in the agricultural policy, but it was improved in the Portuguese president of 92 with Arlindo Cunha, so a close friend or Mr. Best of myself who made this uh, reform. But anyway, we have an open uh, economy and the, uh, the document which I have here, which I shall not read, already from 2020-21 is about a strategy. The last document of the Commission is the industrial strategy for Europe. It is an open strategy. Of course, if it is so, if this is last point, uh, it is necessary to have a stronger uh, single market. Now, uh, already people have spoken about that, uh, of course, 
but uh, uh, something I would like to stress, more and more people use the word single and not internal market. In the treaty, in Article 26 of the uh, treaty, so of the, uh, it is written that it is internal market. Internal gives the idea, this is something stressed also by Mario Monti, so he's telling, of course, the whole former commissioner, so internal gives the idea something closed with borders. A single, it is open also to other people, but I mean what I say when I'm speaking to Chinese students or from any other part of the world, to have a single market, it is to remove barriers between the countries, of course, physical barriers, is to have a normalization of, of the technical norms, and we are improving more and more with digital market and so on and so on, not so much about the taxation. When I was in the European Parliament, I was a member of the budget committee, we could not go very, because there remains the uh, sovereignty principle. I mean, now there was this progress class two, two days ago about the proposal of a minimum of 15% in corporation tax. I hope it will go in this way. So what Europe is doing in the right way is to not to close the borders, not to make protection. Uh, the countries like China and so on could grow because they could export to Europe. Uh, you could say, well, a little bit uh, so in general, because if it is so, we cannot compete. No. Europe give, as I said already, the good example of competing even with the borders, not with very high tariffs. But anyway, what you need is to improve our single market. Somebody has already stressed. And in fact, this is what is being done. It is to improve the uh, so the single market. I mean, uh, uh, good for us, of course. I shall not say to somebody from Japan or from the States and so on. It is for their benefit. It is for our benefit. But this benefits as well. All other countries who have business in Europe even tourists who move in Europe, they do not stop in borders because there are no borders. My family is from uh, the south of Portugal, from Elvas and from Alentejo. I shall never forget uh, the hours I had to wait sometimes to cross the border. Now, they are open, uh, open for us Europeans and also for anybody who does come from outside. So I think Europe is quite a success story. Of course, we should not ever be happy with our situation because we must always improve. So when you say it is okay, I am optimist, I should say. So but, uh, I gave today already an interview to a, a Portuguese newspaper, very well known, Expresso. And I said to men who asked me this morning, so about, well, pay attention because I'm an optimist. But uh, being an optimist, uh, I think uh, giving attention to the things. So I think Europe is a very good. Somebody has spoken, I uh, just repeat that, uh, that uh, the case of Czech Republic and of Portugal is the case of small or medium sized countries. We give a good contribution, and it is uh, interesting because uh, having this dimension, Czech and uh, Portugal, it is supposed to have a leading role, and I hope there's two countries there. In the case of Portugal, it is not uh, the main borders of the Czech Republic. We have, so as uh, uh, somebody said, we have the, the great tradition with the Southern Hemisphere. And so it is the case, okay, it is the case that the Portuguese language is the most spoken language in the Southern Hemisphere, but we understand Spanish, so Portugal has a role. I hope so. Thank you very much, sir, for, for being so long. But thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for providing us, so to say, with, with a big picture. Uh, now, uh, let me move to Jan Macháček, who for, for, for many years uh, has been a well-known commentator on European affairs. Would you agree that uh, Europe is working well? Uh, it's a success story. There are changes that are needed, but those changes are not fundamental, let's say, maybe more cosmetic. And please try to be brief. Thank you. Jan, uh, do you hear me? Are you with us? Oh, uh, sorry. So it really depends like uh, what we are comparing uh, EU with, or uh, it's certainly very successful as far as all the Central European countries are concerned, also as far as countries which also uh, struggled with uh, or came through a period of totalitarian or authoritarian regime like Spain or Portugal before. So for these countries, for countries which experienced uh, communism 30 years ago, it's certainly a success to be uh, inside the European Union. There is no doubt about it. We are prosperous. We are part of a, of a common market, which is uh, very successful. So this is, uh, there is no doubt uh, there has been a success. But on the other hand, uh, there are a few things on uh, which Europe should uh, primarily uh, focus. Uh, one thing is 
if we uh, look not only at Asia, which is uh, growing economically much faster than Europe in last uh, decades, but uh, if, even if we look at the United States of America, which is comparatively uh, equally basically rich uh, country, so the U.S. in last decade only and in, in last two decades basically was growing uh, two times faster than Europe. So uh, if this continues, like uh, Europe will, with this uh, small economic growth, will, will would be heading into uh, being less and less uh, relevant in, in the future. So uh, uh, European Union is excellent as far as... Uh, as uh, for instance, negotiating free trade areas with other partners. I think we are very good in this. We created this common market, as I mentioned, but we should, uh, and we are um, promoters and masters in some smart regulation, I would say. For instance, GDPR is, uh, is a success to me, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we should. Uh, we are masters in the regulation, and we are not masters in innovation. We, we don't have like technological giants which are uh, coming from Europe. So there is uh, something should be done about it. Another thing is that uh, it was already mentioned by uh, my predecessors that we are the we are the biggest uh, ma market in the world. Like uh, European Common Market is the uh, uh, is the biggest in the world, but EU is lacking in the projection of its power outside. So it's uh, only in Africa EU is trying to be active uh, recently. But if we look at the Middle East, for instance, like uh, look who is active there. It's uh, Russia, it's Turkey, it's, uh, it's the US uh, less and less, but uh, nobody is nobody is asking European Union for its uh, opinion about the development there. Uh, EU is also, but this is more about NATO, it's uh, outsourcing its security to the, to the US uh, mainly, and it's also not sustainable, uh, 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 sustainable for next decades. And another challenge is uh, obviously uh, population. So recently someone published uh, in the U.S. a book, but that the U.S. should also be heading into having, why, why to be afraid to have like billion Americans in the future. So it was a very provocative thing. So I was, when I heard about the book, I was thinking that perhaps Europe should also uh, try to, uh, someone should also come with some provocative proposal that we shouldn't be afraid to be much more populous because there is, uh, we certainly have resources for it. Uh, and uh, otherwise, if you look, if you look about the population growth in Asia and Latin America and Africa, so EU uh, is doing fine now, but in future decades, it would, uh, it would diminish and diminish and diminish. So, we should also think about this. So sorry for being too long and I'll stop now. You are not, uh, your, your mentioning of the, that we should not be afraid of having more, more people living in Europe would probably not resonate much on the Czech political scene, but okay, it's, uh, it, it remains to be seen. For the next two panelists, I will apologize in advance for mispronouncing their names since I don't speak Portuguese, but uh, Enrique Burne, uh, if that's correct pronunciation, you work in Brussels and you're actively involved in EU affairs. So from this perspective, you have, how satisfied are you with how is the EU working currently? Well, uh, both answers could be done, made. Yeah, satisfied and unsatisfied, obviously. This is a work in progress always. Uh, but if I can try to be a little bit longer and make a, a longer uh, review of what I think brings us here, let me start by, first of all, thank the organization and most of all, Ambassador 
Almeida Sampai, whom I love to discuss with and often always makes me think, often twice, uh, which is something very nice. Uh, and we usually discuss uh, these kinds of discussions. We usually, when we discuss Europe, we usually tend to discuss either from the national perspective or then from what we believe to be an European perspective. It's not that often that we try to discuss this from a bilateral perspective, two different countries with uh, eventually common perspectives or not. And I think this is really useful. And actually, this ought to be done 27 times 27, because that's that's to make it, to understand it. And when we do like this, and we've been doing this today, we try to find what we have in common. I'll, I'll try to make something which might be risky, which is to highlight what I think we don't have in common. And I think that's very important to understand because the EU is as much about what we have in common as it is about what we don't have in common and where we need to compromise. And I think that's an, a, an angle where we must uh, look from uh, from time to time. So, and, and I'll take advantage of the fact that my first visit to Prague was in the summer of 1990. So eventually some of my uh, opinions about the Czech Republic uh, arise from those days and are eventually, uh, well, eventually will be different even from what the youngster, younger Czechs nowadays believe uh, the issues are. But let me try to do that. Uh, and I would start uh, with, with, the, with joining the EU. For, for ages, we've heard the European Union has, uh, has been presented as a peace project. Basically, it, was, it's, it all started as a peace project. Yes, but both for us, for the Portuguese and for the Czechs, that was not the case. None of us joined the EU because of peace. In our case, we uh, overthrew uh, the right-wing dictatorship. We lost an empire and we wanted to make sure that we were would remain in the, in the sphere of influence of the Western world and would not move into the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. That was a possibility back then. And so democracy was a reason to ensure and also economic progress. That was the reason why we joined the EU. But it's also important to highlight that if something we were assuming that we were going to lose some sovereignty because we had a lot and we had an empire, we were losing both. And we accepted that, or at least we saw that coming. If you look at if we look at the Czech, it happened the opposite. Yes, uh, coming from a, a, a dictatorship, coming from a, but from the left, from the communist state. Yes, it was part of not not remaining in the communist sphere of influence. Well, the Soviet Union was was going away and then it collapsed. But uh, the idea was different. It was fulfilling a promise of joining the West. It was more fulfilling a promise rather than what, in our case, was making sure that we wouldn't go on the other direction. Secondly, regarding the issue of sovereignty, it was the opposite. For years, the Czechs and other countries in, 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 West, in Eastern Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, had suffered a loss of sovereignty. So joining the EU was more of an idea of gaining sovereignty, gaining power, rather than losing. And this, I think we have to bear this in mind when we see different reactions to what we see nowadays. Uh, and then we move to, that's how I see the, the side of history. And to that, I would add that you also have a very different experience regarding World War I and World War II. For us, World War I was something that happened in the distant place where a few Portuguese participated, but we don't have a strong memory and it didn't have a strong impact. World War II is something where we didn't even take part. We were neutral uh, and it didn't happen here. Well, I don't have to explain to the Czechs the importance of both World War I and World War II to your part of the world and the impact that it had afterwards. That's an enormous difference for both of us. Then if we think about geography, we have one big neighbor with whom we have sometimes tense, but at the end of the day, nice relations. Uh, we ha they haven't invaded us for the last 400 years, if I'm not mistaken, so it's quite nice. Uh, yeah, and then we have the sea. And we have the empire, the, 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 the overseas. The Czechs have a, a total different um, geographical implementation. The, the, the role that Russia plays, has played, and eventually will play in the future is absolutely paramount to your vision of the world, I believe. To us, well, it is if we read the news, if we read the books, but on a daily basis, it is far, it is distant. distant. We don't see it in the way that obviously you see it. And, and I don't have to go to what has been happening in the late 
uh, weeks or months or the disputes that you've had with with uh, with Moscow lately, even just generally speaking. Uh, so this is a big difference. It was also mentioned today the importance that you obviously attach or the, the not only the Czech Republic, but all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe attach to the neighboring countries and to the future enlargement. From a Portuguese perspective, even if we officially obviously say that it's important for us, etc., I, I don't think that it's obvious that it's fundamental to our interests. I'm, I'm sure that it is, uh, I, and I'm in favor of it, and I think we are, but it doesn't, it's not top of the list of our priorities, the enlargement. It's, it doesn't come top of the list, uh, which is not the same thing as saying that we don't want it, okay, but it's different for us. Probably, uh, if you'd ask uh, the Portuguese government, uh, the Mercosur Treaty is tops the list more than moving forward on the enlargement, which makes all the sense. Uh, and then we go, let me try to move to uh, uh, the economy. We're both friends of the cohesion. Yes, we depend on the cohesion, but actually in a different way. Uh, statistically, we were, we enriched, uh, we became richer the day the, the, the 10 countries joined the EU in 2004. Not that we actually became richer because, but because countries that were not so good, not so well off as we were back then, uh, joined. So statistically, we became richer, but was not the case. But since then, we actually, so immediately we lost some funds uh, to these countries that were joining the EU. And since then, uh, we actually, we've been over, overpassed by some of these countries, overtaken by some of these countries. Economically speaking, the Czech Republic is, net, is clearly doing much better than Portugal is doing. If we, if we think about uh, employment, if we think about uh, exports, if we think about deficit and so on, it's doing much better than we are. So uh, things moved much better on that part of the world than on that part of Europe than they did over here. Even if we are dependent on some industries, there are some similarities. For instance, we both uh, live with a, a strong relevance for the automotive industry so which means that some of the changes that are about to come and about to occur are important for us so there are two priorities on and that's what we do now two priorities on the political agenda of the eu nowadays uh, at least even before uh, covid and the pandemic which was the digital and the green transition and even on those two aspects we look at them differently on the digital, I don't think there's much difference in the sense that none of us is a champion on the digital world, uh, so that's not the issue. But for instance, on the green transition, the Czechs have uh, nuclear energy and still have a lot of coal. We basically are becoming a country of a lot of renewables. Coal is irrelevant. We don't have and we don't expect to have nuclear. We expect eventually to have hydrogen. So. When we look at the Green Deal and the transition, there is a lot of big difference on what our, on our objectives are. And of course, if we talk about uh, mobility and the impact that will have on, on cars, well, that can be either good or bad if electrical vehicles are still be going to be uh, produced in the automotive factories that exist in the Czech Republic and Portugal, that will be good. If they're not done there, that will be bad news for either, and, either of us. And there may be competition between us when it comes to some uh, automakers where they decide to do, to make their cars. So this is to highlight that there are a lot of differences and yet and yet it makes all the sense and I, I totally agree with what has been said before about the sense that Europe may, makes and how important it is that we're here. What I mean to say is that it is as important to highlight the differences as it is to highlight what we have in common. Because basically the EU is about compromise. And what I think I would like to define it is we need to compromise without compromising our future, which means our existence. Uh, it means that this is a union of states. It has been said it's, it is an unusual object. It's not a, 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 a federation, a confederation. It is an unusual object, whatever. But it, at the end of the day, it is an association, a free association of states that decided to give up some of its sovereignty to work together. So they are willing to compromise, but they cannot compromise on their future and on their on what is fundamental for these countries. And there we go, and I'll be promise, I will be brief, two more minutes, uh, on the current challenges and how they may or may not put at risk what is fundamental. Uh, we look at the world now, and I don't agree with what those that think that we're back to a kind of a second 
Cold War, because I think there are total enormous differences in our relation with China. To begin with, the economic relation that we have with China has nothing to do with what we have with the Soviet Union. So that's the basic difference. And secondly, because there was an ideological uh, um, confrontation, which is still not, which still it didn't start yet. Eventually, it will occur, but it's not what is what is happening now. So, but what we're watching is we're coming back to a bipolar world where now Russia will eventually play the role of a more of a regional power rather than a global power, uh, and where Europe is trying to find its place in the world. Do we want to be this uh, strategic, autonomous, autonomous strategic, or do we, do we want this autonomous strategic option where we're kind of a third way between the US and China? Are we kind of neutral or something like that? I, I totally disagree with that. But that seems to be a kind of an option for some countries. And I think that's not a, uh, an option that, for example, the Czech Republic would appreciate. I think the Portuguese shouldn't appreciate that either. But that's something that is being discussed. And secondly, at the same time, uh, we've seen the US uh, withdrawing from parts of the world, which are very close to us, Middle East. And that means that at some point, we need to be more responsible for our own security in our environment. But how will we do that? Uh, most of us will say that we should do that in the context of NATO. Uh, and I would agree with that, uh, even if it's not, of course, it's not the, the military arm of the EU. It is where we, most of the EU member states, work together in military issues. But we should pay attention to what has been published by an American think tank very close to the current president where it says that the, U, that the US should start to support uh, a new approach to the EU defense, including a more autonomous EU defense strategy. And that's something that we should pay attention because we moved from a president that was saying, you need to pay uh, your 2% and NATO is irrelevant to a new president that might tell us in the future, you should take care of your own defense. We're not going to waste much time, money or resources in your region, so take care of your problems. That's my, that might be what's coming, and we, we should look at that. And finally, and that's where I finish, the enormous impact of the pandemic has two, has a three times impact from the economical perspective, I think. First, it was the emergency, and we, there was a common response. And it hit countries differently, but we all understood that there was an emergency. Then we have the crisis, and it, well, it is different from country to country. If you see the figures, the impact in Portugal was more, it has been bigger than the Czech Republic, and it makes sense. We're more dependent on industries that depend on, on mobility, namely tourism, more than the Czech Republic is. So obviously, we had a bigger impact, but that's not the only explanation. For some member states, the explanation is that they were better prepared. They, were, they had more funds uh, to respond than what ones we have. So the crisis will be different. And that takes me to the last issue. How will the recovery be? We have a recovery which is 27 times, 27 uh, uh, um, projects in the sense that the, the recovery and resilience plan, although is done with money that the EU uh, gives to the member states or, or loans to the member states if they want to get loaned, then it will be used by the member states and it will be used differently. Yes, there are some, some common targets, but it will be used differently. So the question will be, will we be more, will we converge in the next five to 10 years or actually will we diverge in the next five to 10 years? I don't know the answer. I hope we can converge. I'm not absolutely convinced about that. So I hope I brought a lot of problems, uh, some mis, uh, I misread some realities and I hope I contributed to the discussion and well, and I'm sorry if I took a little bit longer than I hope I wanted. Indeed, it was uh, it was a bit longer, but interesting nevertheless. Thank you for that. Thank you for this bilateral and also global perspective. And let me ask Sebastian Bugal as an the political analyst and a commentator. So let me ask about some points that were already mentioned uh, by previous panelists, namely this notion that uh, maybe you. Uh, should project its its power more and should be more able to to be active on international scene maybe to an extent 
that it might uh, be perceived as someone neutral in a competition between the US and China. So if it's a vision that you share and uh, a vision that you deem realistic, uh, thank you very much, Andres. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name as, at least as good as you pronounced mine. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Ambassador Almeida Sampaio for his very kind invitation. It's really an honor for me to be here today. I promised him that uh, I would wear a tie today, and so I'm keeping my promise. Um, uh, I don't have much to say after everything that Enrique has said, uh, which is I, I'm in trouble right now because talking after him, speaking after him, is always difficult for anyone, um, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a nice challenge to have. Um, uh, and thank you very much also for your question, because uh, you talked about, uh, you were asking me about symptomatics that I, I'm definitely into. Um, I like, bef before that, I'd like to, to thank each and every one of our previous panelists for their presentations. Very interesting and also very kind about our inter intergenerational pa panel. Um, what I think about your question, and I think that the Czech Republic and Portugal are really good examples because even with our similarities and with our differences, we have to have an, a perspective on that question. We have to know our place in the world. I mean, we cannot have uh, when the the, the shift the balances of power are, are shifting uh, as fast as they are right now. Uh, our governments uh, have to know where they want to be in 10 years, in 20 years, like Enrique and you just said. The question, I think, can be answered in two ways. First of all, um, in, the 20, in, the, in the 20th century, we understood that uh, the, the, the great wars uh, were fought by big powers, but small countries had a part in the, in the, in the provocation of those wars. I mean, small countries that really were really important in causing such tremendous wars as the first war and the second world war so it were small countries were causing the wars and big powers were kind of fighting them and solving them so that was the the, the 20th century in the 21st century what i think is happening is that big powers are causing tensions and the question that is driven by that is that can the small countries help solve that those tensions I think Portugal and the Czech Republic are definitely an example that, uh, that yes, we can help at least ease those tensions. Another thing, in the 21st century, in the last two decades, at least the first 10 years of this millennium, what we could see was that it was wrong to at least try to impose democracy. So the challenge was, can we take democracy to places in the world where democracy isn't yet? Will it be democracy in those places like the Middle, East, the Middle East that we already talked in this panel? Can we bring democracy to those places? So what I think today is instead of the challenge of imposing democracy to other nations, the challenge today is uh, can the autocracies impose themselves on democracies like Europe? I think those are the challenges. Um, but uh, about the, difference, the differences and the similarities between uh, the Czech Republic and Portugal. Uh, of course, we have a lot of similarities in terms of size, uh, dimension, economics, demographics. But I think the two similarities that bring us together, at least more in a more important way for the discussion we're having here today, are that we're both peaceful nations and we're both Atlantic nations. Uh, of course, you, you're not uh, directly connected with the Atlantic Ocean, but in some ways you're even more Atlantic than us. Uh, and that's very uh, that's very curious in particular, but it makes all sense with your historical um, uh, background. I mean, you survived communism, and we were lucky enough to avoid it, but it was really from the brink of an eye. Um, about this, the, the, this two similarities that we have: the fact that we are Atlantic and the fact that we are peaceful. First of all, the fact that we are Atlantic. I mean, it's the most successful uh, defense alliance in the history of mankind, but and at the same time, it needs to be reformed. Uh, and uh, what, what's the role that Portugal and the Czech, the Czech Republic can play in uh, reforming the, um, the Atlantic Alliance? That's something that I think, that's a discussion that I think both governments should have together. And that's something that I, I wish that the, the, the Portuguese presidency of the European Union should have discussed more. I mean, what's our role in reforming the international institutions and international organizations? We should have discussions about this. About the peaceful, the peaceful similarity, not the Atlantic one, but the peaceful one. 
So if we are peaceful, the definition of peace is not to wage war. So the definition of not waging war is not to have enemies. So we, our diplomatic tradition, very pragmatic, very peaceful, uh, is defined by the absence of enemies, of enemies. So what I think that the 21st century is asking us, and this is where I start answering your direct question. Uh, what is the 21st century asking us? Can we remain peaceful? Can we remain peaceful and with this absence of enemies and at the same time keep our democratic consciousness, our democratic ideals, our, dem our democratic principles? Can we stay democratic in terms of projection in the world and at the same time uh, remain um, more pragmatic in terms of, uh, of, uh, of diplomacy? This is a real question. I think we should, um, in Portugal, this probably is the debate that everyone should be having and it's not happening because, uh, I mean, you asked me about, can we be neutral between America and China? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, one has elections, the other doesn't. One has concentration camps, the other doesn't. Can you be neutral in, uh, between one and the other? You can't. I mean, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's like, uh, I mean, w w imagine yesterday or two, a couple of days ago in Budapest, the, the streets were full with, uh, with people, lots of them uh, government supporters protesting against their own government because of the Chinese finance camp campus in Hungary. I mean, I think that governments in Europe, especially uh, in Portugal and Spain and Italy and the Southern Europe, also in Greece, they fought we uh, have been we've spent such a rough time in terms of economics and finance due to the financial crisis that the people will not care if we sell our infrastructure to china or to other undemocratic countries and they thought that our democratic consciousness as a people was kind of asleep due to the fact that we suffered so much in terms of economics in terms of financial crisis so but i think they were wrong because i think people care <laughs> i think at the end of the day uh, if uh, if you ask if you go out on the street and you ask and, and you ask an European, do you want to be neutral in the most important question in the 21st century? I don't believe that Europeans want to. I do not believe that Europeans want to. Uh, uh, I actually believe that they don't, they don't want to. Um, so um, to answer to continue answering your question, if if we don't want to stay neutral, what's the position have? Because it's pretty easy to say we don't want to be neutral but it's not that easy to answer. Okay, so what? So what, what will you do? So what's the solution? What's the, what's the true answer to your question? Well, uh, if I had an answer, I wouldn't be sitting in my apartment talking to you, probably, but nevertheless, um, what I think we should start doing is instead of letting the big powers in Europe address the foreign policy based on their commercial and economic interests, and that's what we're seeing the last couple of years, and I don't need to mention names. Uh, I think that countries with similarities in terms of Atlantic ties and peaceful tradition in the last decades, as Portugal and the Czech Republic, need to get together. They need to uh, get together and to do some reshifting of the balance of power inside Europe itself on the thinking of, of European foreign policy, because it's really difficult to have, as you all know, unanimity in terms of foreign policy. That's why Europe. It's not a, a foreign policy actor in the world. And uh, it was said in this panel by Professor by Professor Manuel uh, Porto that uh, no one cares about what we about. No one asked Europe about what's going on in the Middle East nowadays. I mean, no one is asking about uh, Europe about what's going on anywhere due to the fact that um, due to the fact that they know that the, the ones the ones that, that that are calling the shots in terms of foreign policy will answer those dilemmas with one thing in their hearts, their commercial and economic interests. And that's why you can't reach unanimity in terms of European Union, in terms of foreign policy, because each and every one of the big powers in Europe will think about their most economic interests. So that's why you don't have unanimity, and that's why you're not a foreign policy actor, because you don't have unanimity, and you have big powers calling the shots with their economic interests at heart. So what can countries with peaceful and uh, with peaceful forgive me, with peaceful and Atlantic traditions as, as the Czech Republic and Portugal can do, they can get together. They can get together and form groups of pressure to those powers and make them accountable and say, our electorate and probably yours too, will rather stay democratic in the eyes of the world than win a few bucks 
and I, um, and I, I really think we should have that discussion. And I think it will be m m much more popular than people will think. Um, and I think that um, when I was uh, studying for 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 this um, conference after the ambassador invited me, um, it was very uh, touching for me because I, I was born in 1995, so I was born six years after the the Berlin Wall fell. Um, but I, I always had this admiration for your people for their braveness and their courage and their fight for freedom against communism. Fortunately, we didn't have to do that in Portugal, fortunately, but you guys did. And uh, sometimes when we try to do politics and we try when we try to to answer foreign policy questions, forgetting our own history, um, we don't make such a good decisions anymore. Um, our foreign, our foreign policy, our, sorry, our secretary of state, our ministry for foreign affairs, which is someone I, I deeply respect and a very intellectual man, a very a man with published uh, work and, and etc. Um, he has this expression about our foreign policy. He, he wants us to, to think about the world as the, the god of time in Greece, the, the god Genus with two faces, right? One from the past, one from the future. Um, and once uh, I thought about asking him, you want us to be Janus with two faces. The problem is they got their hands on our neck so they can see both faces at the same time. Uh, and I think I, I, I've spent my time right now and I'll go back to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, very clear and forceful in, uh, intervention. And you've uh, talked uh, at the end of your, your your speech. You've talked about Czechs and their, their history and the overthrow of the communism. In fact, many many European diplomats accredited to Prague are asking me all the time, "How is it possible that uh, with, with this history in mind, uh, there's there's practically no debate in this country about the EU, its future? It's not part of the." Of the campaign because we have elections in four months time there'll be Czech presidency in 13 months time and apart from migration perhaps uh, the EU is, is not a topic at all practically uh, so let me ask Tomáš Weiss who's an expert uh, uh, in this issue why do you think this is the case and is this the case anywhere uh, in member states that the EU is not much debated or is the Czech Republic an exception? And Tomáš, please uh, try to answer in five minutes. Uh, thank you, Andrzej, and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I, I really think we are not that exceptional in, in these terms. Uh, I think most of people throughout Europe don't really feel attached to Europe. Uh, I think this is something that needs to be changed. Uh, and, and there are a couple of ways, I think, how to change it. Uh, one of them is to build some emotional ties. Uh, and I originally wanted to, to actually build up my contribution on an uh, emotional tie, because I I had an internship at the European Union Institute for Security Studies in 2004 in, uh, in April and May. And uh, so I lived through the accession there. Uh, and it was really interesting. I, I, I personally didn't expect it or hadn't expected how much I felt as a guest there in April and how much I suddenly, emotionally, without any particular reason, felt as within my institution uh, when I came back to the office in May. Uh, and I think I had I was lucky enough to experience this turn and this change. But I think many people don't really have this emotional experience and emotional tie. Uh, they are not interested in politics in general or in European politics. So they don't even have an intellectual argument. Uh, for more Europe or for uh, for being more engaged uh, in Europe. And I think this is something that needs to change within the countries, within their political debates, and it needs to be inserted into the political debate, unfortunately, from outside, uh, from among the journalists, from among the businesses, uh, from among the citizens, because I think for the political elite, it is actually very simple 
to, to maintain this distinction between the Europe and the European level and us in the nation state, uh, because they can play out uh, the differences. Uh, at the same time, and I, I, I would like to, uh, to attach what I want to say actually to what Sebastiao said uh, during his presentation, and, and I, I kind of agree with him. I think what we do have in common in Portugal and, and, and in Czechia is that we are both small states and that being in the EU ensures that we are equal states. Uh, and in the same way as I suddenly felt equal uh, where I had my internship, uh, I think the EU provides us as, as to, to be equal partners uh, with the big countries in Europe. Uh, and they have to ask us about our opinion. It then only depends on us uh, whether they actually listen. If we can make the point well, and uh, some smaller member states can do that, unfortunately, I think the Czech Republic hasn't been one of them. Portugal might have been on, 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 at some occasions, uh, but, but this is our problem. This is not the problem of the European Union. And in that sense, I actually agree that for us, what should change in the EU is, is, the, is more introduction of the qualified majority voting, because the veto is the power of the big member states. It is not the power of the small member states. There is a very interesting column in, in The Economist uh, this week, uh, which actually says that, uh, that the EU is, is, uh, is becoming uh, less hospitable for the small member states because they are slowly losing their veto. But I think the veto is the power of the big ones who can afford not to have the EU position. The small member states can't afford that. Uh, so, so I think what we need to change uh, is, is that, to, to make Europe more relevant by making more qualified majority voting, also in the more sensitive areas, uh, such as foreign policy. And that will push us into thinking more what we are in Europe, what we want to be in Europe, and what we want Europe to be. Uh, and only when we start this debate, we can, we can actually identify where our interests lie. And I will stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, interesting point, especially in a country that's, uh, that has been for, for many years uh, strictly against any, uh, any, anything that goes against uh, having uh, veto powers, especially in foreign policy, but also tax policy, anything basically. Uh, Zuzana Stuchlíková, like Tomáš, you're a researcher in EU affairs, so let me ask you the same question about uh, the lack of, uh, of debate in this country. And uh, please again to try, to, try to express yourself in five minutes, please, although I know it's difficult. I'll try to be very brief and thank you to everybody who is still with us listening. Um, many thanks for the invitation. I will start by explaining why I'm sitting in the forest, actually, because it weirdly enough ties very well to the, to the question that you asked. Um, we are currently here in uh, Berde Mountains or Berde Hills, which is just a few kilometers south of, uh, south of Prague um, with a group of high school students who are actually learning about how the EU works right now. In practice, they have simulations of negotiations. They uh, represent different countries. They, they are actually out there with the army uh, trying to, to play out different scenarios. And uh, I believe that one of the moments where we see that the emotion yes, yes, Zuzana, please if you hear me please, if you hear me Zuzana, please uh, stop your stop stop the Zuzana, do you hear me Zuzana? um we we see that it is about it would be better to switch off your camera so that the, the sound might be better if you switch switch off your camera please right yeah it's better video Thanks. yes okay really sorry for the connection is is probably terrible um, so, yeah, so I wanted to say uh, that uh, what we see here in practice is that uh, it is very much a question of personal experience with the EU, uh, be it throughout 
training programs such as ours or being through personal experiences such as uh, the one that Tomas described earlier. Um, and what we see is that when people are actually having the opportunities to learn more about the EU, to, to actually experience what it is like to, to, to talk about those topics in a European context. Um, they are very open to the discussions and they are very interested in the topics, but this is only the bubble that we are talking about here. Um, and it takes uh, a super, superhuman effort that I believe none of the member states have mastered yet uh, to actually get to spread the information um, and this this uh, experience towards the majority of, of societies. Um, so I wouldn't say that there is not a discussion in Czech Republic uh, about Europe. Uh, it is just a very localized discussion uh, in, in certain circles. And the fact that we haven't managed to actually make it a broader conversation, I think it's, it's very typical, not just for Czech Republic. And we see it on the current topics or as such as the Conference on the Future of Europe. We see it around the European Parliament elections uh, every um, every time it comes around simply because it is very difficult to get to those voters who are not already interested in that. So uh, if we are not seeing uh, a very strong, uh, strong tendency to discuss European topics in the period that we are in now in Czech Republic leading up towards the elections. Uh, it is not particular a question of, of those elections. It's it's really something that uh, that um, corresponds to the general public opinion towards the EU. It corresponds to the fact that the EU topics are very complex and it's not a yes and no debate. Um, on the other hand, uh, the question is whether we should go in a way that we will make it a yes or no debate, uh, much more make it accessible to broader publics or whether we should, as it was already mentioned here, uh, actually keep it as, as an expert debate in many topics and uh, and to, um, to basically give up on the idea that we can one day uh, have a, a widespread debate on Europe simply because it, it feels that this is a goal that, that very often proves to be uh, not particularly realistic. But uh, I want to end on an on a optimistic note and so I will say that I, I truly believe that the longer we are in the EU, the more people we will have who actually have this personal connection to, to Europe, uh, be it through different exchange programs, being uh, through through work experience, being through simply traveling. Now, once again, it's going to be possible after the COVID period. So, so there is still going to be more and more people um, after our uh, our. Uh, um, more and more years in the EU. Um, and I, I really hope that this is the only way that, that there is in order to make Europe a, a more constant presence in, in our life. So I will wrap it up like this. I hope it's a slightly more optimistic uh, ending and I'm sorry for the quality of the signal. I hope you were able to, to hear. <laughs> The sound was quite good, actually. Thank you for ending on an optimistic note. It's always good. Unfortunately, we don't have time for debate, but that's how it is when you have 60 minute panel with seven guests that have a lot to say. So let me thank uh, to all the participants and let me pass the floor to the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and indeed, we ran out of time, but that uh, was due to the quality, the density of the different interventions and these subject matters. Uh, would uh, obviously be uh, food for thought and food for conversation and for debate for endless hours. Uh, and we would remain gladly discussing amongst each other. But let's reflect on what uh, uh, Susanna just said. Uh, we need really to decide at a certain point in time uh, whether we want to discuss uh, at an expert level or what needs to be done to bring the debate to a broader audience. And that brings me, of course, to the discussion we already had on uh, the importance of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, will it be an opportunity to reach out to a broader audience or will it be a missed opportunity in terms of public awareness and in terms of public perceptions about the European project? All in all, this was a fascinating conference. Uh, as Eric Brunet, uh, uh, I also learned a lot, uh, listened carefully, uh, and uh, let me tell you, or to repeat what I said 
to, for the sake of the two ministers at the beginning of our conference, we are going to have all your interventions reflected uh, in a publication. Uh, we are deeply grateful uh, uh, for the fact that the European Commission representation uh, here in the Czech Republic already assured the funding of that publication. It will be a book only in English language, so it will not be a celebratory, commemorative kind of a nice printed edition. It will be a book with the ambition of really contributing to the debate in Portugal and in the Czech Republic about the European project. And our intention uh, is to uh, have the book out in uh, one year's time during the Czech presidency of the European Union, probably in a nice, beautiful ceremony that I would like very much to host at the Portuguese residence in Prague with all of you that I will invite you for that occasion uh, with a uh, uh, a glass of good uh, uh, Portuguese wine uh, in order to uh, be able also uh, to have a, a gastronomic wine uh, tasting note as a contribution to our more intellectual and uh, intellectual and political uh, debate. So with that in mind, but uh, reassuring, reassuring you that you will have an opportunity to review, to revise the text of that book of takeaways of main takeaways from our extensive cycle of conferences that ends today. Uh, as I uh, said at the beginning of this conference, during the seven conferences of ours, uh, we uh, tried uh, to touch all the priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union, plus a conference uh, with uh, the uh, extremely important contribution from the Václav Havel Library Foundation, about the comparison between the two revolutions, the Portuguese Democratic Revolution of 74 and the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia uh, Velvet Revolution. And we have even time, not only for an additional conference on the importance of the Portuguese language and culture, but also an economic forum that will be the beginning of a new dynamics in our bilateral economic and trade relationship. So let me thank you all uh, for your participation, for your invaluable participation. Let me also thank again all the partner institutions involved, the moderators, to you, Andre Yuska, as the last moderator of our last conference, and uh, uh, really expressing the hope that next time we gather together, we will do it on a presential way. So thank you very much. Have a nice day and uh, a nice good last couple of weeks enjoying the benefits of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. Thank you, Jan Mahacek, also for being there. Thank you for the Institute of Politics and Society for your outstanding contribution to the success of our cycle of conferences. Thank you very much. Thank See you. you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.